Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, <coughs> July 15th Bear County Board of Commissioners meeting. It's been about a month since we met. My goodness, it yeah. feels funny. It's been so long since we've Try been back up here. We only have one meeting <laughs> this month, but uh, it's my pleasure to uh, ask the retired Reverend uh, Craig Peel to bring us an invocation. Reverend Peel, good to see you again. Thank you so much. You. Good afternoon, commissioners and faithful county staff. Bring greetings from the North Dare County Ministerial Association. Thanks for the privilege of praying with you once again. So let's pray. Thank you, dear God, for the assurance that even as we have gathered tonight, you have quietly slipped in among us. We're grateful for the sometimes underappreciated gift of government ordained by you to enhance the common good among your people. Especially tonight, we thank you for our commissioners and their staff as they continue to strive together to be a blessing to the children and families of our beloved county. We pray that you will assist them tonight by your one-of-a-kind creative spirit so that they might not only cope with the way things are, but also dream a bit about the way things might be. Help them to notice the little things where details are important, but not at cost to the big things in those places where big picture vision is needed. Dear God, walk with them through each item on tonight's agenda as they recognize a praiseworthy county employee, as they respond to the airport modernization report, as they address the recommended capital improvements plan for 2020 through 2024, and as they listen to the College of the Albemarle Architect and select a construction manager for the Animal Shelter Project. Lord, give them listening ears as they turn their attention to the public comments. Guide them through each concern on the consent agenda and send them your wisdom and discernment as they make new board appointments. You know, Lord, that these are not easy times in which to lead. So throughout their meeting tonight, loan them your grace-filled spirit where they may disagree or come at issues with differing viewpoints, may they honor your spirit living within each of them. And may they walk by no door which opens to a deeper fulfillment of your will for your pe people in Dare County. All these things we ask for your holy name's sake. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Thank you, Reverend Peel. May we stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> County Manager. Yes, sir. Item one on the agenda is the chairman's opening remarks. Thank you, County Manager. As I said earlier, um, been about a month since we met, so I hope you folks will have some patience this evening uh, with me. I've got a, a lengthy uh, um, chairman's update. But before I start, I'm really honored to um, make a comment of a dear friend who was a commissioner on this board for many, many, many years, for many, and that's Richard Johnson and his his wife is with us tonight, Cheryl. Thank you for being here. God bless his service to this county. It's a pleasure to see you here this evening. <clears throat> the first, uh, first item I have uh, on Chairman's uh, comments is um, uh, Omi Tillett, 90 years old, of wine cheese, 
passed away July the 5th. Native of Adair County, he was born 1929, March 1929. And um, along with his father and brother, Tony, Omi pioneered the Outer Banks offshore charter fishing industry. Uh, he was captain and sportsman of the Oregon Inlet, and his boating skills were certainly renowned and second to none. And on January uh, 2009, Omi was awarded the Order of the Longleaf Pad, which is the highest civilian honor in North Carolina, for his exceptional accomplishments and ex exemplary services as a citizen of his community. He was a member of the International Game Fisheries Association's Hall of Fame. And in 2010, um, um, he was a dare living legend. Um, he, uh, he began every single morning by blessing the fleet, which started a tradition, a tradition that certainly continues today. So our thoughts and prayers continue to go out to the uh, Tillett family on the passing of, of Omi Tillett. I have had several calls in the recent week, and I'm sure Commissioner Couch has had these calls and emails as well concerning the speed limit on NC-12. Um, there was some concern that the Dare County Board of Commissioners had changed the speed limit on 12. We do not have, folks, the authority to do such. <laughs> um, <laughs> most of you are aware that uh, Park Superintendent Halleck uh, has Kite Point now, which is just south of Canadian Hole, which is a good-sized parking lot and area there. And um, uh, this time of year, there are a lot of visitors coming to the Outer Banks. In fact, last year they were there were 2.6 million visitors to Hatteras Island. Now, I can't imagine how many vehicles, Mr. Couch, that might have been. But they park alongside the road. The Kite Point area is overflowed, as well as Canadian Hole, if you're familiar with that area. It's a 55-mile-an-hour speed limit. The superintendent reached out to um, NCDOT, asked them to consider lowering that speed limit for the summer months, <coughs> strictly based on safety. NCDOT took him up on it and they reduced that speed limit between Avon and Buxton about a three to four mile area to 45 miles an hour. It will go back to the 55 <coughs> in September. So in defense of uh, certainly Superintendent Halleck, I think that was a smart move. Um, it's strictly based on safety for our citizens. And there's been several instances there that have occurred, and we certainly don't want uh, any deaths to occur in that area. So just keep in mind, folks, Dare County Board of Commissioners, we have no authority to change any speed limit whatsoever on the roads in Dare County. On Monday, Janu uh, July the 8th, um, Commissioner Ross, the vice chairman, myself, our county manager, and our um, finance director had a CPI meeting to, um, to look at uh, our CPI program and our projects. And, and tonight uh, on our agenda, uh, item six, we, the, um, that will be presented to you uh, by our, our um, finance director, David Clawson. Seems as though um, global warming is uh, another hot topic these days throughout the country and, and the coast. And um, Mrs. Barbara Barrett, who, was with, who is with the um, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, uh, contacted me on the 10th of July and asked if, um, if I would uh, have some comments concerning um, 
uh, sea, level, sea level rise and beach nourishment. And I had a very good conversation with her. Um, I haven't seen the article yet printed, but uh, I'm confident something will come out soon with that. She, I had her also reach out to our planning director, Donna Creef, to uh, discuss um, uh, sea level rise and nourishment uh, with her as well. July the 1st, Monday, Commissioner Couch again, what a great day it was. It's hard to believe that it was 20 years ago that the lighthouse was moved on Hatteras Island. And um, Commissioner Ross and Vice Chairman and myself were there for the 20th anniversary. It was a great turnout, a great, uh, a great day. Had a lot of very good speakers there. Uh, some historians, and um, I learned quite a bit uh, from those historians that spoke that day, and it was a pleasure to be down there, and I appreciate Superintendent Halleck asking me to uh, say a few words. We continue to uh, promote COA throughout the county. Most of you are aware that we have funded uh, money for scholarships for COA. We're on the cusp of, of uh, building a new multi-use facility here in Dare County. As a matter of fact, um, that is uh, also uh, on our agenda this evening, and um, we'll be discussing that. But I had the opportunity uh, on June the 26th, a Wednesday, at lunch to uh, make that COA presentation uh, to First Flight uh, Rotary Club, and they were extremely impressed to see what uh, our board has agreed to do in, in um, helping our kids fund, fund our graduating seniors um, to go to COA. Um, the week of July the 10th, I had the pleasure of meeting the um, interim uh, president, um, the COA. As most of you are aware, I'm a trustee on that board, and we're in the process of searching for a new president for COA. Um, and uh, right now we have a um, an, uh, four month um, interim president, uh, Dr. Twyford. No relationship to um, the Twyford properties that we have here for COA, but uh, just a, a, a great individual, uh, very very um, very very um, informative of of uh, what takes place in, in community colleges, and and uh, he comes to us as an interim. Um, uh, president for the next four months, and I look forward to uh, working with him. He'll work with us uh, through some of this process uh, with the uh, new facility. Um, next item I have is on uh, uh, June the 20th, uh, Commissioner uh, Tobin, uh, uh, Commi uh, Artie Tillett, and Ann Pratera. Uh, we had a meeting um, to, um, to discuss the uh, scholarship program, I've asked uh, Ann Patera to chair this along with Artie Tillett from the school administration and, and Commissioner Tobin. Commissioner Tobin had prior meetings, but he's a part of that task force that's going to develop the scholarship program. Uh, Commissioner Tobin was out of, out of the country at the time, but um, uh, he's part of that program, and they're, they're going to meet. We're excited. We want to do this right. We, we uh, do not want to do this for the uh, uh, fall of uh, 2019. We want to make sure that we have uh, everything in place and do it right. So um, we will uh, have this uh, criteria put together so our kids can apply uh, for scholarships. And this will start January 1 of 2020. So. Um, and any graduating senior of this year, if, certainly if they go to COA or whatever uh, during this fall semester, they can still apply uh, for that scholarship fund. We don't, we don't want to uh, eliminate anyone that's graduated from this, this, this past June. So I'm looking forward to Commissioner Tobin and, um, and Artie Tillett and Ann Patera to bring us uh, that criteria. Um, that will allow our kids to, uh, to apply for scholarship uh, monies. Um, Commissioner Ross, um, 
I know I would need to take a lesson, but you probably wouldn't, but uh, Schuster's trophy case is exploding. exploding. <laughs> I mean, what? She's remarkable. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. She is incredible. Incredible. Um, Does everybody know who we're talking about? Just, just uh, Catherine Schuster, just a few weeks after she uh, captured the North Carolina Junior Girls Golf Championship at First Flight High School, she's taken the title of the Girls North and South Junior Championship in Pinehurst, North Carolina, which concluded on, on July the 3rd. And as I said, her trophy case is, is uh, exploding. Um, she's winning the prestigious 2018 National Chip Putting Competition at, at Augusta, uh, Georgia, and she captured uh, two high school state individual championships in 2017 and 2018. So she just consent, continues to set the golf course on fire, Commissioner. Uh, this has not been confirmed, but I have it on good authority that during an interview in Northern Ireland, Tiger Woods was quoted as saying, I want no part of her. She's too, <laughs> She's too good. I love it. I love it. Uh, some more on first flight athletes. Uh, Madison Crumpler um, uh, was the uh, 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 Under Armour w Woman of Will Awards. Uh, uh, Jalen Olmer, best all-around female athlete. Zach Hughes, best all-around male, male athlete. And D Dylan uh, Blake, most outstanding male athlete. And, of course, uh, uh, Schuster was most outstanding female athlete. Certainly, additional congratulations go out to Sophie Farah. She was the 2018-2019 Student of the Year from Manny High School. Uh, in addition to that, the Theater of Dare uh, awards two scholarships annually. Uh, one was presented to uh, Carolyn Novak from Ocracoke uh, School, who plans to major in uh, theater and education at the Methodist uh, University in Fayetteville. She got a $2,000 scholarship. And Kyle Logan from Manio High School, who plans to major in drama, musical theater at Catawba College, uh, received a $1,500 scholarship. So our, our students in DARE just continue to raise the bar and, 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 uh, and uh, set, set uh, all kinds of examples for, for our uh, uh, younger kids uh, coming up in, in the... Uh, school system, so hats off to all of those um, uh, graduating seniors. Um, each year, more than 3,500 high school students from across the country, now this one here will really, really surprise you, participate in the Veterans of Foreign Wars Auxiliary Young American Creative Patriotic Art Contest. The contest began in 1979 to recognize up and coming artists to encourage patriotism in, in our youth. Any student in the grades nine to 12 who is enrolled in a public or private or parochial high school or home study program in the United States is eligible to enter this contest. Well, a young lady by the name of Ashley Stewart a rising senior at Manio High School, was the first place winner of this year's local patriotic art contest held in April by the Outer Banks <coughs> Veterans um, Auxiliary. After winning the contest on the Outer Banks, her painting was sub subsequently entered in the North Carolina Young American Creative pa Patriotic Art Competition at the state level. It was announced at the joint VFW-VFW Auxiliary Council of, of Administration in Cary, North Carolina <laughs> on Saturday, June the 21st in 2019. She had won the contest for the state of North Carolina. Her painting has already been shipped to Orlando, Florida to compete against the artwork of the remaining 49 states throughout the country. The winner of that contest will be awarded a $15,000 scholarship. So the national winner will be announced um, on July the 20th, 24th at the VFW, VFW Auxiliary uh, Convention 
uh, in Orlando, Florida. So we'll keep our fingers crossed for Miss Stewart and uh, hope that uh, she wins that. She's so, phenomenal. Once again, guess, um, yeah. unbelievable yeah. stuff by our students. It's unbelievable. Um, and speaking of scholarships, the Community Foundation recently, uh, this just recently awarded 30 Dare County students scholarships totaling $192,000. So hats off to the Community Foundation um, uh, for issuing those 30 um, scholarships uh, to Dare students. Um, I've just found out today, <clears throat> we have, as most of you know, a number of months ago, we had some uh, flooding issues on Roanoke Island, and um, Roanoke Island drainage study is hopefully coming, coming, uh, coming down to the wire here. We, uh, uh, we, I was informed that, um, that uh, the proposal and the drainage improvements options uh, have, um, uh, have are being put together for uh, the to for the state uh, to to um, uh, NCDOT to review, and they hope they hope to uh, finalize those recommendations in the coming weeks. Um, if they can uh, get this done, they're hoping to uh, make a formal presentation by the end of July, and that was uh, that was from uh, Ryan Smith of Moffat and Nichols. Uh, which uh, sent an email to uh, Gretchen Byram at uh, NC uh, DOT concerning that study. And um, last but not least, um, last 30 days have been um, pretty hectic for myself. Uh, I have a 93-year-old mother that uh, lived in uh, Chesapeake that um, I had to move uh, here locally to... Um, Spring Arbor, uh, assisted living. Um, I cannot. Um, uh, I cannot speak uh, uh, any greater words for Spring Arbor and, and the and the support I've gotten out of them. I know Commissioner Ross. I had spoke to him earlier, and his father-in-law was there, and uh, he said, "Bob, you, you won't go wrong if you put your mother there." And uh, I'm very very pleased to. To say that my mother has, has been there for about a month now, and I can't um, thank Spring Arbor folks enough for all that they've done um, to help her. Um, most importantly, I want to thank uh, our Health and Human Services Department um, that uh, they go over there. They help folks uh, uh, age. You know, we we've, we've got age that go all the way from uh, duck all the way to Hatteras, and just the work that they do is incredible, and I, I just uh, I just can't say enough for, for the our, our staff in Health and Human Services, and also for the folks at Spring Arbor. I have been over there every day. I have some new friends, quite a few as a matter of fact, uh, that uh, pull me aside, but there are two particular individuals there that uh, I could not be more proud of. Uh, one is Mr. Evans, uh, who's been there for a good while, I think since 2009, <coughs> and that's uh, Mark Evans's father, who was a former police officer in Kill Devil Hills. He immediately reached out to me the first day that I was there, wanted to know who I was, wanted to know uh, who I had brought there, and I told him about my mother and he immediately reached out and introduced himself and was um, very very helpful he's got a lot of knowledge there and um, and I can't thank him enough for his friendship and and, and uh, his sharing his concerns and and expressing his uh, uh, thoughts for my mother and, and being there and helping any way he could so another another lady there I call her Miss Mary, but it's Mary Utz. Mary, if you're watching live right now, I hope that you are, but I want to thank you for being another uh, good neighbor. She immediately, that same day, reached out to me, and she goes by and knocks on my mother's door, goes in, and talks to her. 
But uh, she is a uh, veteran in the, of the Navy. She served uh, in the police department at Fairfax. And she has a man that's incredible. She loves um, uh, the, the EOC type work that, that's being done and the communications. She's into communications big time. And so I've uh, reached out today to uh, uh, our EOC director and asked him if I could bring a group of the folks from Spring Arbor uh, over to the EOC building and let him show them um, the new technology. So we're hoping to get that done in the next couple of weeks. But those two individuals, I I'm, I'm personally want to reach out and say thank you for um, being so kind, and thank you for introducing yourself and becoming good friends. And I look forward. I go over there every day, and I see them every day, and I, and I appreciate what they're doing to uh, help my mother's situation. So um, with that being said, County Manager, I know this was lengthy. I apologize, but a lot's been going on in the last 30 days. So that completes my chairman's comments. Chairman, that brings us to item two on the agenda, and that's the presentation of the county service pins. Uh, we have one tonight. If Sarah Bradshaw would come forward to receive her 10-year pin from Sally Helms. Good evening, ladies. Good evening. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I have the distinct honor of... Uh, presenting Sarah Bradshaw with her 10-year pin with Dare County. She is a social worker for with the Dare County Department of Health and Human Services, Social Services Division. Um, she has been with us for 10 years. She also worked in Iredell County as a social worker. Um, she puts her heart and soul into every case she works, and her specialty area is independent living and our teenagers and our aging out of foster care youth. Um, She's so committed to those kids and adults. <laughs> um, spends countless hours on the road, checking on everybody. Um, I can't, couldn't ask for a more dedicated employee. Um, and Dare County is certainly fortunate to have her. She is also oftentimes in the county employment. You have other duties as assigned or being voluntold to do other things. Um, we are one of 11 pilots with the state um, computer system, NC Fast, and child welfare. She's our county champion. Um, on top of handling her caseload, she also handles all of us and walks us through all of our, our daily struggles with learning a new system. So um, I joke that plan to get another 20 years out of her. So uh, <laughs> here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. That brings us to our employee of the month and pat her when we'll make that presentation. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. <clears throat> Randy has no idea why he's here today, <laughs> tonight. Um, Randy Grantham is an operator at our Stumpy Point water treatment plant. The plant meets the water supply needs of that close-knit community. Randy goes above and beyond duties as a treatment plant operator. It does not matter if it is the water plant, the grounds, vehicle, hydrants. Everything will be found neat, cleaned, and well-maintained. Randy works outside of his job description on a daily basis to help at the wastewater plant once his water plant duties are completed. Randy is the first person the locals ask for when they have an issue or a question because they know he'll take care of it. Randy is an asset to Dare County Utilities and the community of Stumpy Point. He is always there to help with a smile and a kind word. So congratulations, Randy. Do you want to say anything? No. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations, Randy. Thank you. Before we go to public comment, those of you that just received an award, if you'll go right out through this door so Dorothy can get a picture, please. Here. Ladies and gentlemen, now's the time that's been set aside for public comment. If you have public comment this evening and you've not signed up, please raise your hand. I'll recognize you. 
When you do, please come to the podium, state your name and where you're from. Please limit your comments to five minutes. There's a, red, a green light that will come on when your time begins. A yellow light will come on when you have about a minute left. And when the red light comes on, you need to conclude your remarks. Uh, on the sign-up sheet, I have Colleen Shriver. Welcome, Ms. Shriver. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Woodard and Commissioners, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am Colleen Shriver, and I live at 118 Carolina Court West, Manteo. I am here representing the property owners of Carolina Pines West. Carolina Court West is a non-state maintained road with public access. It is primarily used for ingress and egress for the 11 properties in Carolina Pines West. These owners, including my husband and I, believed that because of our financial responsibility to maintain the road, that the definition was similar to a private road. No one understood nor imagined that somehow between six to 15 plus additional property owners would be granted regular use of our road. Recently, a new subdivision, Burnside Estates Phase 1, was approved. To our knowledge, Phase 2 has not come before the planning board. At the time that the ownership of the property at the corner of Burnside Road and Carolina Court West was transferred, I contacted the new owner for details. After our discussion, I scheduled an appointment with Planning Director Donna Creef. Donna was very helpful in explaining the decision made and listening to my concerns of what I perceived to be unintended consequences stemming from the new subdivision, Burnside Estates. After that meeting, I was able to provide the other homeowners with the information I learned. We understand that by law or regulations, the new subdivision did not require a public hearing nor public notice. We hope that by <coughs> hearing from us, the board will set county protocol so that at the time that a developer wants to access a non-state maintained road where the subdivision owners are financially responsible for maintenance, those property owners will be contacted even though public notification is not a requirement. We cannot be the only property owners on a non-state maintained road who misunderstood that their restrictive covenants didn't protect them, but actually gave us a false belief that our financial obligation provided us control of the use of the road. As property owners, we first wondered why the developer of Burnside Estates would not be required to access a new subdivision via Burnside Road, which is a state maintained road. In looking at the plat, it is obvious that access via Carolina Court West gives the developer more lots and thus increases the owner's financial advantage. The substantial increase in traffic, especially if Burnside Estates Phase 2 is approved, will generate maintenance costs that we haven't sustained in 31 years that the road has been there. This additional traffic places an unplanned financial burden on the 11 property owners of Carolina Pines West. We ask that the restrictive covenants for Burnside Estates, excuse me, phase one and phase two, if approved, include the same language as number 14 of Covenants of Carolina Pines West, whereby the property owners within Burnside Estates will also be responsible for the maintenance costs of Carolina Court West. Stormwater flooding is now a large concern to our community and our properties. As we all know, stormwater flooding has increased, creating substantial property damage on Roanoke Island. The access granted to Burnside Estates requires access over a large stormwater ditch, not a swell. The existing ditch currently manages stormwater flow for approximately 95 acres of watershed. By adding three driveway culverts in phase one, and a culvert for a subdivision road for access to phase two, if approved, will be an impediment to the flow of this vitally important drainage ditch. In addition, we are all making an assumption that someone within the county government will monitor the maintenance of such culverts. We are requesting the board to be proactive and obtain an engineering analysis of the current and future water flow within the ditch based on this information. This should be completed prior to the Burnside Estates Phase 1 construction improvement of lots 4, 5, and 6 and additional clearing of land so that properly engineered culverts become a requirement as opposed to culverts meeting minimum standards. Our road has not flooded to date. During the backwash flow from Irene, the water in the existing ditch came within inches of the crest. Crest. The ditch held and flooding did not occur on our road. Development should not increase the potential for damage to property owners. 
We need your help now, not when the pro problems begin. As it is time, 100% of the property owners in Carolina Pines West are in agreement for our road and the stormwater ditch to be placed in NCDOT's system of maintenance. The road was built to state standards per our plat, and we need your assistance to complete the proper procedure to ensure our success. Again, I thank you for not only hearing our concerns, but also for your consideration of action and for your future communication with us. Thank you. And I have a copy of what I've said and the covenants. Yeah, if you would, you please. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ryman. Other public comment. Anyone else like to speak at public comment? Seeing you here, any public Seeing comment in Buxton? Public comment in Buxton. Yes, I have one speaker, Mr. Wes Lassiter. Welcome this evening, Mr. Lassiter. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Um, I, I came here because of a concern we've had for a number of years. I, I, I spoke to Bobby about it at one point, but. Uh, here on Hatteras Island, um, I'm a, I'm, I have a, a, an art business or a pottery business, which I've had for a number of years. Um, and through those years, the first years that we had, we, we, we did extremely well. And as the years gone by, things have tapered off for us uh, quite a bit. We've seen that, uh, also a plethora of shows that have come down here on the island. I believe we have probably two or three a week now, all during the season. It used to be that maybe it'd be one, uh, one a week, or maybe one every two weeks, but now it's really increased. We have a farmer's market that has two places that sell food and uh, another 30 or 40 places that are selling uh, craft, and people can come in all over the island. And um, I think we're, I don't want to be accusatory of what's happening on our island uh, as far as how much money we're losing. I know I'm losing a, quite a bit myself from, from these shows, uh, impacting, direct impact. I don't know how much, but I, I was hoping that you would consider looking into it uh, and seeing what would be the right thing to look into uh, as far as doing this. In Boone, they did a, had a thing, had a, a program to say, uh, Watauga County to bring businesses back to the businesses, and they figured a way they'd had to limit the shows. I don't know if, if that's the answer. Is the answer uh, regulating them? Is the answer uh, making them pay uh, insurances just like we do? I don't know, but I, I just feel like it needs to be addressed, and it is hurting a lot, a number of businesses here, and I get complaints all the time, and uh, I just wanted to say something about it. And I uh, figured that something, any discussion, <coughs> that maybe you could look into, do a, do a study, uh, say, you know, if I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Uh, and if uh, other people with these shows to take a look to see what maybe the county can look into it. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lasser. Appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Any other public comment from Buxton? No further comment from Buxton. With that, Mr. Chairman, we'd close public comment and move to item five on the agenda. This is an airport modernization report. This is going to be a repeat performance. Um, several weeks ago, or several meetings ago, uh, we had Mr. Lane come down and make a presentation to us about airport modernization. It was interesting and something that we all listened to, and the next morning when we were running the tape, we had a glitch in our system that we didn't get the recording, it didn't go out on TV, and so if you weren't sitting in the room that night, you didn't see or hear it. Uh, he's been generous with his time and kind to come back, and he's going to make that presentation again uh, so that the public can hear it and so that we can also record it to play uh, in the future for people to see and hear and, and understand what he's saying about our airport. So, Mr. Lane, thank you for coming, and the podium is yours. Thank you, <coughs> thank you very much, Bobby. Uh, uh, thank Welcome you, back, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Chairman Woodard, Vice Chairman Overman, and your fellow commissioners. It's, it's not that I'm unaccustomed to encore presentations, but I don't think I've ever had to do one before. <laughs> so thank you for this opportunity, and, and I especially want to thank the, the public when they show up to meetings like this. It's an important demonstration of, of their interest and commitment to the community. Uh, let me also this time introduce my colleague, Deborah Watts. 
who was very important in the conduct of this project. Uh, I'm here to speak on the subject of uh, the decisions you'll be facing on the question of modernizing the, the Dare County Regional Airport. And I, and I hope that the work that we performed and I'm presenting tonight about the economic contributions that the airport makes will uh, will aid you in that in that decision process. Uh, my background is uh, about 30 years in economic development everywhere from the, uh, the ground level, working with economic developers, doing projects across the state, uh, up through working at the University of North Carolina on some of the big picture issues on state level strategy. And in the process, I've, I've consumed a lot of economic impact studies. And I know we as members of the public, we hear a lot about proposed economic impact of projects, and I'm sure you as commissioners hear those things as well. Uh, as someone who's not only consumed a lot of them, but produced a few of them, I'm well aware that quite often those reports can seem somewhat abstract or perhaps even seem exaggerated in terms of the impacts that they describe, or at the very least, they describe them in ways that don't seem entirely credible. Um, so certainly in the performance of a project like this, which I know has ramifications for your decisions, we wanted to make sure the sort of information we were gathering would be based on this, a direct portrayal of the way that the airport contributes to your community as is possible. And it's not that, the, that things like indirect effects and multiplier effects are, are illegitimate, but I do think it's clear for you if we're able to describe the very direct mechanisms through which the airport contributes growth in the community and probably in ways that previously you didn't consider. Uh, I have been active here in Dare County, particularly here on Roanoke Island, throughout the course of my career, and, and both professionally and, uh, uh, and in some of my, uh, my advocational interests. I'll, I'll be back here later this summer to install a, a new historic marker here on Roanoke Island that I was pleased to be a part of. So I was, it's certainly no hardship for me to come back to Roanoke Island and Dare County and speak with you here today. I mentioned that the goal of this project was to provide the information to help you make the decisions about modernizing the airport. And in that sense, we were focused on the economic impact of the airport, but not in just a strict numerical sense, but the other ways it contributes to the employment and the income and even the tax base of this community. I think uh, it's always good to, to understand uh, that as uh, the client was the Dare County Airport Authority and, and the project cost $19,500 and took, took place over the course of January to April earlier this year. What we were focused on was both the current impact of the airport and also the impact it might have under a scenario in which it was modernized to include specifically an extension of the primary runway. It's currently 4,300 feet. And while the final figures for the length of the extension and certainly the cost of that are not yet resolved, we looked at the scenario under which it would be extended to 5,800 square feet at an, at an approximated cost of $30 million. Regardless of what that cost ends up being, one important thing to note is that the contribution from the local level that you would be asked for is 10% in general of what the total cost would be. And in fact, that in and of itself has a considerable economic benefit to your community. So the question of what we looked at and what we looked for is we looked at what the current economic impact of the airport is, what the effect of the construction process of the modernization, like the runway extension, would contribute in the short term, and more importantly, what the long-term benefits would be of an expanded, modernized Durham County, Durham, Dare County Regional Airport. Uh, and what we looked to find were the impacts in terms of the growth in general economic activity, the GDP, if you will, of Dare County, the level of employment in the community, the amount of income that that employment would create, and the level of state and local taxes that would be generated. Now, I apologize, but of necessity, there are a lot of numbers involved in a presentation <laughs> like this. The reason I circled employment is because I think, first and foremost, what we want to see in terms of economic progress for our community are good quality jobs for our citizens. So in every case where I'm citing these impacts, I've, I've emphasized employment as one of the desired outcomes. Very interesting question when we approach this project of how does one understand the impact of an airport like 
Dare County's airport. Now, most airport studies are a little simpler because they're looking at big commercial airports, those airports that we travel to in order to get on a, a commercial flight and fly someplace else. Big airports like that are studied fairly commonly, and we look at very large budgets that they have, the large number of employees who actually work for the airport or at the airport, and then we look at the sort of businesses that serve the airport. That's typically what a large airport study would look at primarily and see what the effects of that are. But in an airport, increasing like the General Aviation Airport of uh, like Dare County, you also need to look deeper to see how aviation enabled by the airport helps businesses in your community grow as they take advantage of the flight opportunities, but for both themselves, but in many cases, even more importantly for their cargo, and especially important in your case, for customers of Dare County-based company, companies. And in order to assess those other factors, we put a lot of an emphasis on talking to the marketplace, getting out into your community and conducting interviews with what we characterize as critical constituencies, talking with business leaders, talking with uh, policymakers, talking with people like many of you in the room who are part of this process. And once again, my colleague Deborah Watts took the lead on this point. But the point of this was this is not merely a numerical exercise. It's one that we rely upon the market and people who understand this community and its economy well to help us identify the more subtle ways in which something like the airport contributes to your community. Here are our major findings. Well, let me first summarize that North Carolina has a marvelous network of airports. There are 72 public airports in North Carolina. Oh, there are hundreds of airstrips, but there are 72 public airports. Ten of those have commercial scheduled commercial service. 62 of them, like the Dare County Airport, are general aviation airports that host a variety of aviation activities but do not currently have a scheduled airline serving the community. And those 62 are scattered across the state in urban as well as rural, rural areas are in many ways an underappreciated part of the economic infrastructure of this state because they come into play in so many business decisions that typically don't catch our eye. But still, in that context, Dare's airport has a relatively modest level of activity. Uh, now, certainly, because of the seasonal nature of much of your activity here, it varies tremendously. <laughs> but most of our work was done in, the, in the, uh, the early months of the year, where obviously activity at the airport was rather, rather less than it is during its peak. But I have to say, in general, the level of flights, the number of planes that, that take off and land, is a modest level of activity. And that can be quite deceptive, because what we found in our work was that it's not the number of flights that determine whether an airport and the extent an airport contributes to your economy. It's the type of flights that you host. And that was really what is one of the major findings of our work with you. And I think it informs not only your decisions, but some of the decisions that are being made at some of those other 72 airports across the state as they assess the value of their airports as economic development assets. But I would also caution you that one of the things that's going on in the national aviation industry, and particularly within the air fleet, the sorts of airplanes who use your airport, there are some changes underway that I think um, suggest that the status quo is not sustainable. You cannot stand still because there's a change underway in the type of planes that you are serving, and many of them require aspects of your airport that are increasingly inadequate. Mr. Lane? Yes. Two questions. During our peak summer season, about how many flights per week take off and land at MQI? Well, that's a very interesting question because I was just informed that they're actively monitoring it right now to test that issue. And perhaps if you wanted to speak to somebody in the audience who's got the most current numbers on that. Second question. Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to the changes, going from what to what? You said there's changes going on in aviation. I'm wondering what it's going from well, I, and I, to. I'll, I'll get to the spoiler on that. Uh, there's a shift in the general aircraft fleet from small single propeller airplanes to multi-engine turbojet, uh, I mean turbo, uh, turboprop and, and jet aircraft, larger aircraft. Okay. So there's a general shift in the U.S. air fleet from smaller single propeller aircraft <laughs> to larger aircraft who have different operating parameters and requirements. 
And in particular, what we found is that the, air, the airplanes that have the greatest impact in this community are on that large end, an increasingly large end. Well, just to focus on the subject of what the current impacts are, then I'll talk about where, how they're derived, is that you have an impact on the, on the size of the Dare County of about $77 million coming off of the Dare County Airport right now, 513 jobs. Now, there are not 513 people working at the airport. And that's not what I'm implying by this, but the, the airport contributes to your economy, 513 jobs and almost $27 million in income. And it, that's, a, that's a result of, of three different types of activity that we studied. One is just the operation of the airport itself, just the number of people who work at the airport and the spending by the airport and buying supplies and working with companies to support the airport. Then there are the airport uh, affiliated businesses, the aviation enterprises, those that are physically at the airport or are part of the aviation cluster that relies on aviation on a routine late daily basis. And then there was a third category. Those are the business activities, particularly in your community by local companies, who use aviation to bring in customers to deliver cargo and product, and in some cases for their own travel to serve a regional business network. Those are the aviation-enabled businesses. <coughs> As I said, the operational uh, operations of the air credit set have a modest economic impact. Only nine of the 513 jobs I'm talking about are actually from the airport operation itself. So this is very straightforward. This is the budget of the airport. This is the number of employees they have, and the amount of taxes that that activity generates. So if we're talking about the impact of the airport, we have to look beyond the airport's operations itself. Where then do the impacts come from? To a certain extent, a larger set, say 51 jobs, come from businesses that are physically located at the airport or are part of the aviation industry and situated somewhere else in Dare County. But these are the ones that are most directly identifiable by we as lay people, uh, as business, as aviation businesses, the, the, you know, the, the banner towers, the air tours, those sort of activities. They're rather obvious, and, and if you combine the 51 jobs here with the nine from the, uh, the operations of the airport, you have 60 jobs. Now, I will tell you, as someone who's Let's just say I'm, uh, I'm someone who's quite aware of the Wright Brothers' history in North Carolina. I served for a while on the First Flight Society board, and I started a, a, a startup business facility in the Research Triangle Park called the First Flight Center. I'm very much a, a, a student of uh, the way the Wright Brothers undertook arch, uh, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, there are only 13 companies I was able to identify in Dare County that are directly in aviation itself. So despite the long history of aviation here, you don't have a lot of businesses in the aviation business itself. What you do have a number of are companies who rely on aviation, who are enabled in their business strategies by aviation. And that's where the vast majority of the total 513 jobs come from. 453 of the jobs that we identify come from companies who rely upon the airport to deliver products and particularly to deliver customers to their sites. That's what we call air commerce. That's the use of aviation and the reliance upon an airport to conduct business. Now, most of <laughs> air commerce takes place in relatively smaller aircraft, smaller in the sense that they're not flying on commercial jets. Smaller business aircraft, uh, corporate aircraft, general aviation aircraft. And that's a level of business that sometimes gets overlooked when we look at economic impact. These are flights of uh, generally less than a thousand miles, but they are serving a very critical function within the business model of a wide variety of businesses. And as I said here, the innovations in aviation that are taking place right now in many ways are likely to increase the role of air commerce in the U.S. economy. So in terms of MQI, the, the FAA designation for the Dare County, regional airport. For MQI, it's important to recognize that the air commerce that takes place out there is not a function of the number of flights, but of the type of flights. Um, and you were distinguished from many other airports in the state, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute, because most of the flights that occur, according to the FAA, 
are non-local. A local flight is one that starts at one place and ends at that same place, like an air tour or like someone pleasure flying in their personal aircraft. That's not air commerce. Air commerce is more generally when someone's transporting products, people, uh, customers from one location to the next. And in your case, that's the vast majority of the types of flights that are being recorded at DARE. Now, let me just illustrate a little bit. There are 17 peer airports in eastern North Carolina. These are general aviation airports. You're one of the 17 that we compared your activity to. So when we talk about peers, I want to differentiate. These are those 17 airports, and this is the percent of their flights that are air commerce flights. They're known as itinerant flights. They began here, and they went somewhere else, or they began somewhere else, and they came here. You are remarkable in the share of your flights that are air commerce flights. That's why you have a disproportionately high economic impact coming from your airport. And that, again, is largely because the airport is enabling businesses based here, in many cases, most cases, started and grown here, who have been able to grow their businesses and sustain their businesses because they rely upon the airport to transport products, cargo, supplies, and, again, particularly customers. And the main sectors that rely on it to bring in high-end, what we would say affluent customers, who bring a lot of money with them and fortunately leave with less when they depart are in your custom boat building business. Uh, I was awfully hard, sorry to hear about Omi Tillis passing because that, certainly the offshore charter boat industry has been one of our real shining stars here in East North Carolina. But charter boat fishing in, in, in Dare, particularly the offshore fishing tournaments are a high dollar activity. And then we have a set of, of mega house rentals and events that also bring us in. This select group of affluent customers who arrive and depart from Dare County uh, using private aircraft and relying upon Dare County Airport for that. And let me focus on one in particular. I'll cover a couple of them. But let's focus first on the boat building industry. Uh, this is not something that's easily captured by most economic development studies, but it came out very clearly in our engagement with folks in this community and this economy. They know full well that your boat building industry here, because it's so focused in many cases on large, expensive, what we could call luxury craft, is highly reliant upon global customers who can access their boat in the process of it being constructed and they do it routinely and they send a number of people down, captains and architects, to oversee the process. They rely on their ability to access the boat builders here in Dare County, particularly in Wanchies and, and here on Roanoke Island. Uh, now this is the cumulative economic <coughs> impact of the boat building industry, 532 jobs. Not all of those jobs are attributable to the airport. But about 25%, at least, you could safely attribute, depend upon access by customers to the boat building industry through your airport. Now, for some of your companies, it's 100%. For some of them, it may be less than 10%. But it, on the average, at least, 25% of the economic activity, the jobs, the income, the tax base coming out, coming out of boat building, is reliant upon the kind of access that the airport provides. By the same token, you have a number of high dollar tourism activities that serve global markets. Not just in North Carolina, not just the East Coast. I mean, the Outer Banks certainly serves a million people a year, and the vast majority of them drive here, of course. But there is a substantial, though rather small percent, who fly in, and those who can will fly their plane in to Dare County at your airport. And they have a very large economic footprint. They spend a lot of money when they come here. If they're part of a fishing tournament, they may drop ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to be part of that process. If they're here for a wedding, they will spend large sums on mega events and houses. Uh, and if they're coming clearly down here uh, to be part of, uh, of the offshore charter boat fishing, they will spend a lot of money. So the numbers are certainly small compared to the, your total tourism numbers, but this is a select group of aviation-enabled tourists who have a large, dis disproportionately large effect on your economy. 320 jobs of the 513 we identified are a function of 
high-end global tourists coming here. And if you get an opportunity to speak with any of the folks engaged in this business, you will have anecdote after anecdote examples of uh, global teams of visitors coming down to fish for a week. It's not at all a remarkable story. Let's just say, it's remarkable to me, but it's routine and an important part of your economy. So in terms of the current impact of the airport, again, it's 513 jobs, and this graphic just shows how we identify what they're derived from. They're derived from a combination in very small ways of the operation of the airport and of the aviation companies themselves, but the vast majority comes from local businesses relying on the airport to bring in customers. Now let me focus on the significance of those jobs. You have a lot of employment in Dare County. You have a large economy. But the sort of employment and the sort of jobs and the sort of activity that comes specifically out of these local businesses enabled by aviation is a distinct one and a significant one. Those 513 jobs, because they are for activities that require expertise, higher skill training, they are in high margin business activities, are higher quality, better paying jobs. They pay an average of $53,000 compared to the, the prevailing average in there of $30,000. And in many ways, because these are local-based companies, the owners live here. The owners grew up here. They spend their money here. They hire from here. They buy from suppliers here. And when they earn profits by bringing in global customers who leave their money behind, the money tends to circulate within Dare County. While we did not calculate or add to our total the leverage effect it is still a very real phenomenon because the vast majority of companies that rely on the airport are local. There's a higher leverage effect from the, uh, the wealth that they help attract from their customers. And it's, and it's not insignificant that much of this activity is, be, is taking part in what I think of as heritage industry and activity in the southern part of the county. A lot of this activity takes place um, here in Southern Dare and uh, on Roanoke Island itself. In many ways, it reinforces the distinctiveness of this community with its history and maritime. Now let me look at the, the issue of the uh, potential modernization impacts. Let me first point out that um, you have an excellent airport, I would say, approximately from the early 1970s. Uh, it's not that it hasn't been updated. It's a fine airport. In many ways, the infrastructure is ill-suited for even the current fleet of aircraft, which is why they're encountering some challenges with some of the planes that come in right now. And that's in large part because your runways are simply shorter than your peers, and a short, air, uh, short runway cannot accommodate even some of the current craft that would like to use the airport, forcing them to use some of your peer airports, and it's going to be an increasing issue going forward as the U.S. aviation industry shifts from smaller to larger aircraft. Let me show you a comparison to, to, to your peer group again. Uh, as you can see in the red bar, you're significantly smaller than the majority of your peers, shorter than the majority of your peers. This is the primary runway. There are three runways, but the large, longest primary runway is 4,300 feet. So you're, you're certainly at a disadvantage competitively, even within your own region, much less nationally. Now, just the construction process of a modernization like the runway extension would have short-term economic impacts. It's important to acknowledge that those things exist, but it's, uh, I think, less important than some of the long-term benefits. But because, in this particular case, any expenditure required at the local level is leveraged 9 to 1, in other words, you're only covering 10% of the cost, most likely, this is a significant return on whatever commitment you would be asked to make. But probably more, certainly more significant is that this, the expansion of the runway uh, is expected to create a, essentially a, 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 nearly a 50% increase in the current economic impacts, growing the job from 513 to over 700. And that's quite straightforward. You cannot serve the existing demand for the types of aircraft that would like to use it, and as the market shifts to more aircraft that are unable to use your current airport, you have an opportunity in front of you in terms of existing and projected demand. One last factor that was not part of the original scope of this project, but came out very clearly in the conversations we had with, your, with you in some cases and with your fellow citizens. <laughs> this community, typically at the end of about an hour-long discussion, someone would raise the, 
the reality that it sure would be nice not to have to drive to Norfolk to get on a plane. It sure would be nice not to have to drive to Raleigh to get on a plane. But people would raise that quite hesitantly as though it was uh, somewhat of an of a over-ambitious goal. But I think it is something that can be increased in likelihood with the modernization that you'll be looking at going forward. Certainly extending the runway has been the reaction by some of your other regional airports to accommodate commercial service going forward. So extending the runway, for instance, is not being looked at in the near term in order to secure scheduled commercial service, but it would certainly increase the possibility going forward. And I would suggest you that that may be something to put more emphasis, because as important as the airport is right now to some of your key industries, uh, I think it can have greater significance long term to what I think of as the demographic challenge you face. And I'll cover that very quickly. You have what I characterize as a missing middle problem in your population, and also I'd say in your workforce. Uh, the U.S. Census data defines prime working ages between the age of 25 and 54. And in your community, one that's always distinguished itself in coastal North Carolina from other tourism communities is a real community with schools and churches and all the, all the real aspects of community life. You are losing the segment of your population which is identified as the prime working age. The share has declined from 47% to 39 in, in just the last de uh, two decades. And what's really stark is if we look at the total net growth in your population, 7,000 people net growth in the population here since 2000, only 23 people of those 7,000 are between the age of 25 and 54. Wow. Now, we're not here to extend a runway and modernize an airport specifically to address this issue. But I know from my economic development work and my workforce development work that one of the issues that people consider in locating early in their professional careers, their family starting years, their home buying years, their business starting years, is they require access to commercial air service. So it's not that people are leaving this community because you don't have commercial service. I'm afraid they're not even considering coming here as future residents, future employees, future employers. And that's one of several, one of several factors you might address in looking at uh, what I think is a significant demographic challenge you have in addition to some of the other things you are addressing. We recognize that uh, the prospect of commercial air service might help you remove some of the barriers to a key demographic coming to your community. So let me just quick, quickly review the conclusions. Uh, first thing to emphasize is, uh, just like in aviation, if you're not moving ahead, you're falling. Uh, you are, you, no area in the world has a longer aviation heritage than you have here. Uh, but the truth is, the aviation industry is moving ahead, and if your infrastructure can't accommodate that without the kind of modernization that, that is being contemplated, uh, your status quo will not be sustained. I think you're already seeing erosion in some of the business activity due to these constraints, length of runway, inability of aircraft to use it, certainly inability to use them under certain prime environmental conditions. When it's hot, big planes can't land here. When it's, or, or much of the year, big plans can't refuel here. So there's a number of very practical issues that need to be addressed uh, that I think are creating constraints, but for your current impact and also certainly for your future. Uh, you don't, the airport doesn't contribute to this community through its flights. It contributes through the more uh, basic reality of providing access to the world for your citizens and your citizens who own businesses. Uh, that was really the original purpose of the airport, was to provide the access. You had access, you had, you had access by air before you had bridges. I mean, that's the fundamental role that this, this airport has played and will continue to play. And particularly because the sort of businesses that you're supporting are locally based, they provide a better bang for your economic investment because they focus on hiring local people for high value products, selling to global customers, attracting new wealth in the community, keeping it in the community, and paying better wages as a result. And in the process, they add, I think, an important layer of economic diversification in a community that's, of course, increasingly dependent upon, and rightfully so, it's your competitive advantage, focused on tourism, 
Your tourism season is expanding. There's a lot of growth opportunity. Some of that growth opportunity in tourism is enabled by aviation itself. But I think the, the role that the airport plays in supporting particularly the boat building and the charter fishing sustains an important element of your economy. There it is. That's a, that's a terrible graphic here, the plane that ran off the end of the runway. But I think it illustrates very much the, the, uh, the concerns that users of the airport would have going forward. Uh, is that this, that uh, reality is you can't stand still on this. You're going to need to address the length of the runway going forward. That's not the only modernization issue, uh, but I think it's not only an obligation to do it. You need to recognize it's also a significant economic opportunity. Let me see if this is my last slide to your great relief. It is. Uh, as it says here, the purpose of the airport is not to generate jobs, it's not to generate income, it is not fundamentally an economic role. The role of the airport has always been and should always be providing access and increasing the quality of life for your citizens, whether it's through business activity, whether it's provision of emergency medical services, whether it's uh, uh, public safety, the airport has a vital role, has had one historically, and needs to continue to have that kind of role going forward. And I think that's what commends your consideration of modernization there, more so than strictly the economic aspects of its contributions. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to address any questions that you want to pose. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Um, one quick question. Would expanding the length of the runway encourage uh, a full-time FBO? Yes. Um, one, it would almost certainly increase the number of flights coming in, but it would also change the nature of the flights. As I said, you already have some pent-up inability to serve larger, particularly jet aircraft. It, the larger value aircraft, the larger aircraft, makes you a more attractive market for a full-time FBI. Great, great. That's, that's important, I think, very much so. Um, anyone else? Commissioner Ross? Mr. Lane, does your study, or did you contemplate, is it reasonably feasible to extend the runway on land or into the sound or some combination of both? I was very careful to exclude that from the scope of my work. <laughs> so you didn't look at that at all? Uh, Knowing that that's something that would need to be looked at extensively, it extends beyond the uh, the scope of what we were doing, certainly the scale of our project, we did not look at that issue. So the $30 million could be on land, could be over water, could be who knows? Well, I think we're all familiar that you live on an island, and there are only two directions the runway could be extended. One is right, on land and inland, and one is offshore. That's the question. Yes. So the <laughs> but, answer is we don't know. But I will say from the standpoint of looking at the economic impact, that wasn't a factor that was going to affect the economic impact. It certainly affects many other aspects of this modernization. I have a question. Yes, Commissioner um, Assume that we went ahead with the construction of the runway, either on land or in water. Would that main runway be shut down during the construction time? And if so, what are the economic impacts of shutting that runway down and relying on the other one that's a I much think that's shorter. A, an excellent question for someone other than me. I think that's a question for both the administration of the airport and for the, the design and engineer folks who would be involved in it. Okay. I, as, as, a, as someone who's, who, who values the contribution that the airport makes, I can't see shutting down the airport. Let, let, me, let me spin off of that for just a minute. You have companies in this community that rely on the airport to an extent that, but for the airport, I don't see that they're viable businesses. And that would put a premium on maintaining the operational basis of the airport under any modernization scenario. Uh, it's a boat building business in particular is, and it's sort of said the, the offshore, it's a very competitive industry. You're competing with Florida. And in many cases, the boat building and the fishing centers in Florida uh, have far superior airport service than you do. You have a you have a competitive advantage, in many ways rooted in the brand value 
of, of Hatteras and Roanoke and the Outer Banks. It's a strong brand value, it's business school talk, strong brand value. But I, I do see that it would be imperative from my standpoint that the airport remain operational under any scenario. Thank you. Commissioner Count, you had a question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if we could, uh, we've got David, the airport director here, and a couple of board members. Is it okay to ask them to come up and maybe have a question or two for them? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. David, you want to come for it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much for the chance to speak with you. I, I do think many of your questions that are prompted by this presentation are better addressed by, uh, by the authority uh, rather than myself. So I welcome the opportunity to surrender the lectern to David. I was just fine sitting back here. <laughs> um, the question about shutting it down, I would think there would at least be times it would be closed. If we had a larger aircraft that needed to arrive, and this is not a, I'm not answering this 100%, but uh, they could make a reservation. We could, you know, get construction stopped or whatever, you know, if it's a crane or whatever's in the way and, and have them land. <clears throat> Anything else? Did you have something else, Commissioner County? I think it's time. You know, I, I don't know my way around the money enough, but uh, I just, you know, we've got a screaming economy here, and we had the study from NC State there that, you know, indicated if we're going to expand, yes, tourism is our bread and butter, but if we're going to expand on that and expand into other directions, we've got to meet the challenges of what's coming. And uh, air is going to be it. Uh, there's a lot of cars on the highway, and it's it's not too terribly difficult to fly here. Uh, but I'm really sensitive to the fact that we may be getting a bit of a uh, idea from people that you can't get there from here by air, and that bothers me. Point well taken. One of the reasons I asked the question about if the runway was going to be interrupted is we get a lot of shipments to FedEx, UPS, they all fly in aircraft every day. Um, and a lot of my customers come in by aircraft. In fact, the jet that went off the end of the runway that was in that crane was one of my customers. <laughs> Tunstall. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the questions about whether it was going to go looked at going into the water or on land. I think it was a combination of both. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, yeah. in, in the, the original work that the engineers have done, Rob, a little bit has been uh, on land, uh, relatively speaking, a very little bit. Yeah. Most of the extension has Would been be into the, the sound uh, by, by necessity. Yeah. Uh, there's just, there's just, in essence, nowhere to go. There's no room. Uh, they, yeah, there's just nowhere to go on land. Uh, so, so the majority of it, by far, would be uh, in the sound, which is, uh, from an engineering standpoint, it's not a big deal. I mean, you go all over the world, and and runways are built out into the ocean and out into sounds or, or whatever. It's not a. I don't want to say it's not a big deal, but it's not a big deal in from an engineering standpoint. Right. right. Anyone else? I can sit down now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank Brent, you. thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming back. Good Appreciate job. It. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Lane. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. County Manager. Chairman, items six, seven, and eight will be presented by the finance director, Dave Clawson. Good evening, David. Good evening. Um, Um, you have, Cheryl provided you with a copy at your places of the PowerPoint, and um, you had copies in your mailboxes of three documents, the write-up, um, uh, a short summary, and what I call the, the capital improvements plan, which is the two pages of 11 by 17 sheets. Um, PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Um, the Capital Improvements Plan Committee met Monday, the 8th, 
And due to that date and me getting everything ready, it didn't get into your agenda packet. So I said you got copies later. Um, and you've got these three documents that are at your places. That are at your places. Um, now, Pat's sitting here, and I saw I feel extra bad, and I already felt bad because water is not in here. They did what they were supposed to do three months ago, and I have not gotten to it yet. So you'll get that in August. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the capital investment fund because that's how we got the cap, the recommended CIP projects. That's how we got to those to tell you that we can, how we can do them and how we can afford to do them. You'll you'll get that um, presentation. I've scheduled uh, the Carters, DEC, and Associates that made the presentation at your board retreat for the middle meeting of August. Um, we're doing that because there's a there's a debt section in the model. Everything's done except for that debt section where we're tracking different levels of debt, and we'll have um, what he calls rating metrics, but it, it'll be things like debt service as a percent of your budget, all the different measures that the rating agencies and we should be looking at to tell whether or not what we're proposing to do in the future with debt will create any problems and we're staying within the, the measures that, that we should be staying. Um, when you adopted the general fund budgets that just started July 1st, for the first time you split operating and capital into two pieces. So on the budget side, you've got your 10 fund, which is the general fund, which is now just operating. That's just operating cost. Then we have capital investment fund, which is our 11 fund, which is all the debt service and the capital. And when later in the year, when you see us talking about audits and comprehensive annual financial reports and whatever we, it comes time to do <coughs> rating agency reports, those will be consolidated into one reporting fund. Um, so that will come. You've seen this before, we changed it a little bit, but as a reminder as how that capital investment fund worked, the blue boxes on the top are the sources, so you're making a transfer from the general fund. The Article 40 and 42 sales taxes are partially restricted and have to be used for school purposes or school debt service or capital. All of the lottery money has to be used for school debt service or capital. Land transfer tax has to be used for school for debt service or capital. And then on the outgoing, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I'm Ross. just uh, reflecting, Dave. All the blue boxes sum up to about twenty million dollars into the fund, and the yellow boxes about twenty million dollars flowing out of the fund. That's correct. Right there, um, the the outflows. The outflows are existing debt service and future debt service. Then the county capital improvement plan and the county capital outlays, which are cash basis. Uh, same thing for the schools, capital outlays and CIP. And then we've, we've done replacement plans and a helicopter maintenance because those are large item, ticket, large ticket items when they happen. Um, and then you'll see in the middle of August when we do the presentation, the whole point of that fund is to say, what can you do in the future? What's your capacity in the future? Um, what are your options and what effects will it have? So we'll bring that and show it. Um, as I said, we did the CIP recommendation within the fund model. We also did a roof replacement plan. I had a lot of help from Shannon Fulmer at Public Works and Keith Sawyer. Um, we've got a plan for 24 different buildings now and scheduled it out by year. Uh, we did a HVAC replacement plan for 23 different buildings. It's got 23 worksheets within a workbook and a, a different column for every piece of major equipment. So like this building's got a column for the air handlers upstairs, a column for the heat pump out here, a column for the... Uh, the chiller out in the parking lot because they all have different lives and need to be replaced in different years. But we got all that done with the help of facilities maintenance. Um, we also did um, major equipment that pops up once every seven years or once every four years, and that's the, um, the law enforcement emergency management and EMS um, 
radios, communication radios, the EMS cardiac monitors and defibrillators, and uh, mobile data computers that the sheriff and EMS uses in the vehicles. And then the hardest one we did uh, that replacement or that maintenance reserve for the uh, Dare Med Flight helicopter. And we actually based it on, did some research and aircraft leases. If you're the company leasing the aircraft, you're not paying for that maintenance, you're, but you're including that cost or an estimate of an annual cost in that lease. And it's a reserve. If you don't use it, great. It carries over and, and you maintain that amount. Um, and you add the next year's lease amount into it. But you also have to factor, factor in all the, the, the inspections, some of which are based on number of hours, some are based on the number of months that goes by, all the overhauls, the scheduled replacements, and there's certain high cost items that could fail. And they use a, a percentage chance of failure in a range of costs. So that's how we came up with those numbers for each year. Um, now, moving to the small sheet, which is the, the summaries. Um, if you do all those things that we have shown in the CIP and the replacement plans and the major maintenance, these are the fund balances that we'll, we'll, we'll maintain or an estimate of the fund balances we'll have at the end of each year. The first two years were the years that we had to get over the hump um, and just less than a million dollars in each year. Um, on your sheet, I included three columns on the upper left. There is a column that has all zeros in it that says ending fund balance reserve for the school system. At whatever point you end up with more revenue that's coming in that's restricted for schools, and that's more than what you spend in that year for schools, you have to reserve that amount. And I included it in here because that happens in 2026. That's when it flips because of you know, the, the debt service back from the 2000, mid 2000s through 2010 on schools will have gone away. Um, the pay go amounts for the school's capital outlay uh, is uh, the school CIP, the county CIP are listed. And then we, we list all the the amounts we came up with from the replacement plans, uh, the large number in 23 is the Justice Center. Uh, and then on the HVAC replacement plans, the large number in 24 is the, the COA performing, or, uh, Professional Arts Building. And then the major equipment replacement and what we came up with for the reserve for the helicopter. And in a minute, I'll talk about there's two debt issues that we've included in the plan. You know about what we've been calling the 2019 limited obligation bonds. Um, I'm calling them 20 now because it's going to be after January 1st before we issue them. And then uh, uh, one for EMS facilities in 2022. Uh, the middle section of that summary just has the, the fund activity, what your beginning balances are, how much is coming in each year, how much is going out each year, as Commissioner Ross mentioned, and the ending balances. And then the debt issues included <coughs> is the bottom section. Um, the, the next issue we have, which I said will be in 2020, includes the COA project. I was right. just going to identify the approximate, not specific amounts, Dave. The COA is around nine. Animal Shelter 2, DHH. S building was four, five. five. And then uh, the next ones were? Uh, the Manio property was uh, right at one million. The Buxton property was 325,000. We're also, as part of the plan to make those first two year fund balances work, recommended that we include two of the CIP requested projects for EMS equipment right. in the debt, but only do them over a five-year term, not a 20-year term. Um, then the, um, the t in 2022, uh, an, an issue for EMS facilities, which yeah, we've two, got five, an, Oakley, uh, an Oakley two, Collier two, five, report one, that's three, maybe 12 25. to 18 months old. And we base that number off of that report. Um, then in, in the model, which you'll hear about next month, we've also included replacement, in later years, replacement of public works and the next phase of uh, 
uh, College of the Albemarle. Um, then these are debt service summaries. The first one just shows if we, with what we already have in place and with what's recommended in the plan, this is what the estimate of the principal each year would be, the estimate of interest and the total. And then for the principal amount, which is the, you know, the debt outstanding by year, you start out this year with $68.8 million outstanding. The additions each year, the principal payments each year, and at the end of five years, you'd end up with 60, about 69.4 outstanding. Um, then the plan itself, which is the larger 11 by 17 sheet, the first section that there is all in green. The first half of that section are projects that you've seen before and that were approved in last year's capital improvements plan. So, um, we're doing the school capital outlay at the amounts requested, the school's capital improvements plan at the amounts requested. We've uh, taken out a jail HVAC rooftop unit for 78,000 because it's included in the HVAC replacement plan. Uh, you got a, the next sale for the CND landfill, which covers 23, 24, and another 500,000 in 25, which is the sixth year not shown in the five year plan. Uh, public Works re uh, moved a, a backhoe. It was already in there, but they moved it back uh, two years to 2024. Um, EMS Mobile Data Computers, that one's 365,200, which I said we're recommending we finance those with the 2020 issue, in or and again, just for to maintain an adequate fund balance. Um, Add 163,000 to the downtown Manio project, which would give you enough to do all four of the buildings on that block, plus the interior asphalt and curb and gutter, um, which we already have quotes for. Um, we reduced the amount for the public works facility study from 100,000 to 75,000 based on how much we were charged for the health and human services study. And then the last one, uh, EMS facilities, we, we had programmed in 100000 a year for the whole plan, but if we're going to do the issue in 2022, we don't need that 100000 a year starting in 2022. Then the second half are new things that showed up this year for the first time. Um, as you know, items, well, you, you have a new public works director. Items 10 through 14 are all public works related and she's done a, an evaluation of what she needs to be, thinks needs to be replaced, and these are all replacement items, 2021 through, through 2023. Mainly large equipment except for number 10, which is replacing the weight, the weigh scales at the Buxton Transfer Station and the uh, station at the solid, or the scales at the solid waste transfer station. Um, number 15, the manager asked, Pat and his people to look, his people that run Stumpy Point Sewer, they're also responsible for the package treatment plan at the detention center. Um, that is 1992 old, uh, and they determined it needs to be replaced. The replacement cost is 224000 The other alternative is to connect it to the town of Manio sewer system at 276000 with the 276,000, we could eliminate enough operating costs so we'd have a three-year payback on that. So it's included as the sewer connection. Um, number 16, we had a request from the airport authority for 85,000, which is a 10% match to an FAA grant. Um, staff and then the committee don't recommend that inclusion because the county, we went back through 2009 and included it in the request packet. Um, the county's never done that before. And based on the history of what the airport's done for those local matches, unless it's a, a large project like you were just talking about, um, we feel like they can afford to make that match. Um, number 17 was a new request from EMS to replace the cardiac monitors. 
uh, cardiac monitors and defibrillators, and then some new equipment for a AEDs and cardiac <coughs> compression devices, and that was a million one hundred thirty-three thousand. And we cannot make that work unless we include it in the debt issue. Um, then a camera system upgrade at the jail. It's an old analog system, which they, to be fair, recently have started having problems with. And they've been advised that not to sink money into an old analog system and just replace it with the digital system. Uh, IT remote support software. And then the county manager had $150,000 request uh, for unspecified building security based on and after what happened in Virginia Beach. Um, the second half of that uh, schedule just shows you uh, here shows you all the roof replacements by facility, all the HVAC replacements by facility. Uh, we don't have a major equipment replacement until 2024, and then shows you the amounts by year that we have for uh, the reserve for uh, major maintenance for Dare Med Flight. And finally, you'll get this again in August, but this is just a reference sheet. This is all the assumptions we have in the model. Um, and then on the left side, I'm a CPA being associated with the financial projection, so I have to make that statement that it's a projection and things change and they could change in a big way. So um, what we're requesting is that the board approve the capital improvements plan and authorize the manager to execute the budget amendments and capital project ordinances because I haven't gotten them finished yet and then return to you with a report on what those budget actions were. Um, okay. Thank you, David. Any, any questions of David? Yeah, I've got one. So according to this, our EMS facilities, which are in bad shape, are still going to be another three and a half years out? Well, if it's a 2022 issue, so there's two things with that. We'll have a much better, we'll start back on this model in about six months to update it for the next year. Mm -hmm. It's possible that can move up a year based on fund balances and based on what revenues do. The, the other thing is that's when the debt issue is done in fiscal 22. What we normally do is hire consultants and architects well before that. Like with the COA project, right. we're, we're approving the architect right now, but we won't issue that debt until next March or April. Yeah. So we've got a lead time. I have the board adopt a reimbursement resolution. So if it's a 2022 issue, we can easily start with design and things like that nine to 12 months <coughs> before that. And, and if you recall, we had $100,000 a year that we had set aside to do the things that we needed to do to right. keep those places operational and safe and all that between now and when we could actually do, the, do the either the rebuilds or the repairs. Those dollars are still there in those first two years so that we can continue to maintain them and keep them up as we go through the planning process. I mean, this isn't something, we're not doing one building. We got a, I, I know, it's, it's a big, big project, deal. And, and so I, and I it's going to take some time to get it to a construction stage. In the meantime, we didn't want to throw money in a hole. So we tried to make that balance and Jenny's sort of balance in the books so we can do what we need to do to keep it operational before we replace or repair. Again, you've got some timing issues with when you can borrow the money and when you're ready to borrow the money until we get the estimates. We don't have you know how much money to borrow. You've got to do that upfront work first. That takes a year at least, get a year to get started. So that time, that two year time frame is just about right to when you borrow the money, <coughs> but not to when you start working on it. It's just right. when you, you borrow the dollars and you don't have to start paying it back till you borrow it. So that's why it's further out in the. It's not the start date, it's the debt date. Right. 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 <coughs> Anyone else? Is there a motion to approve the recommended capital improvement plan for 2020 through 2024 and authorize the county manager to execute the necessary budget amendments with a following report to this board of those budget actions? So moved. Hello. 
there's a motion on the floor by the vice chair uh, <laughs> by Commissioner Bateman and I believe Commissioner Ross. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by <laughs> Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, David. Thank Chair, you. before you go to the next item, just one thing I want to point out to you. By having right. just approved that, you've now approved the funding, and we've got in place the plan to begin the demolition right. of the old admin site, and that's supposed to start in mid-August. So with that approval, we'll move that process forward, and you'll see some activity out there uh, in the coming weeks. Sounds good. That's exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. That's good. <laughs> I guess that uh, brings us now to uh, item seven. Is that correct, Commanding? <coughs> yes, item seven and eight. Dave will do those also. And I'm sorry, seven is College of Almaro. <coughs> yeah, College of the Almaro. Okay, seven is COA. Okay. Um, last meeting, you approved the selection of Boomerang Design as the architects for the COA uh, new building or COA project. Um, Boomerang had to develop their own estimate in order to derive at an architectural fee. So you have their estimate in your packet. Mm -hmm. You have their uh, contract, their, their first draft of their proposed contract in the packet, God, and an amendment to a capital project ordinance to uh, establish the budget for that contract plus certain owner costs and additional oh, items. Um, again, the Capital Improvements Committee met on Monday the 8th. Um, that, based on input that they had gotten from COA for square footage, they voted to, to send to you that the contract be for new construction of approximately 26,000 square feet. And Boomerang's estimate for the total project is $9,126,000. Um, as compared to what you had in the prior um, CIP that you adopted last year, the project grand total was $8,500,000. And that included a ballpark number for work at the old Russell Twyford site. Um, since then, in meetings with COA and the manager and chairman looking at that site, they said there needs to be just very minimal, um, very minimal renovation work at that site, and it can't happen until the new construction is finished. So comparing the numbers to what you had in last year's capital improvement plan to their estimate, with a million five of state bond funds, we would have we had planned on last year borrowing seven million dollars for the project. In the capital improvement fund, uh, capital investment fund model you just saw, we had increased that estimate to seven million five hundred thousand. Um, with the boomerang estimate, we would need to borrow seven million six hundred twenty-nine thousand, which is one hundred twenty-nine thousand more, which over nineteen years of principal does not really have any effect on what we just what I just showed you. Um, the architectural contract is a fee of six hundred seventy-three thousand seven hundred sixty, and that's eight point eight percent of construction costs, which is very reasonable with what we've seen for other projects. They've included a $250,000 contingency, which is 3.2%, which should be okay, but um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, we're still working on furniture fixtures and equipment um, as to what the funding source for that will be. We know that at the current Curry Tuck project, in addition to the state bond funds, COA is paying for the FF&E. So we've made an inquiry about that today. Um, in the capital project ordinance amendment, you, you increase the architectural contract up to that 673,000. We've also included their estimate of 105,000 for construction testing and surveys and 41,000 for owner cost and their estimate for demolition at the existing site of 400,000. Um, so the board is asked to approve the boomerang design contract <coughs> with any review changes that the county manager deems necessary to authorize the manager to execute the contract 
and to approve the amendment to the capital project ordinance. And I'll add that we got a draft back this morning of all the changes that Bobby had asked, and they've all been made. So, any questions today? So moved. There's a motion on the floor by Vice Chairman uh, Overman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Couch. Thanks, man. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Uh, the next no, item no, is the selection of construction manager at risk for the animal no, shelter. Um, again, uh, the Capital Improvements Planning Committee met on the 8th and voted to recommend Whiting Turner to you as that construction manager. We took requests for uh, qualifications and we got two responses, one from Whiting Turner out of Chesapeake and one from A.R. Chesson out of Williamston. Um, you couldn't go wrong with either choice. Uh, Whiting Turner was the, uh, built the CSI, they built the COA uh, Professional Arts Building, and they built the emergency, our emergency operations center. Uh, the architect, Walter Todd Sadler, recommended Whiting Turner, and so did staff <coughs> and the Capital Improvements Committee. So we're asking you to approve that recommendation, and we will get started with them and return to you with a what's called a part one contract, which is to get them working and involved with the, with the project. Then the part two of the contract will be the guaranteed maximum price, and that'll come at a later date. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, pleasure of the board. Move to approve Whiting Turner uh, as the construction manager at risk for a CIPC recommendation and instruct the county manager to return to the board with a contract. Second. <clears throat> Motion on the floor by the vice chairman has been seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign? Aye. Motion carries unanimous. Okay. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again, Dave. Chairman, that brings us to uh, item nine, and that's the Rodanthe Channel. Um, I don't know how many of you all are familiar with Rodanthe Channel, but uh, we have an emergency ferry system that comes into play when we lose the road uh, at Merlot Beach, and it runs from Stumpy Point across the Sound into Rodanthe. Uh, there's land there that we own that we've allowed the state to build a ferry terminal there. There's a federal channel that comes out of there and goes out into the Sound to allow the ferries to get back and forth uh, to Stumpy Point. Um, in the spring, before every hurricane season, we get with the ferry division and say, run the channel, tell us what's going on, so we know that it's open, we know that it will work. Uh, and they did that this spring and found that it needed some dredging to get it to proper depth so that they could operate the ferries in there should we have a storm that took out the road later this year. We've been working with them in the Corps um, since the spring to try to make that happen. Um, and frankly, we've just run into problem after problem after problem. Um, it's a federal channel. The Corps would typically do it. Um, the Corps says they don't have a dredge, that all, their dredge that can do a project that small is in Texas and they can't get it up here. Uh, then, then they don't have any money. And so we went to the state and said, this is a ferry channel. Uh, you know, you all have a dredge. Come in and dredge it. Let's get this thing open before hurricane season gets upon us in August and September and October when we have the bulk of our storms. Well, ferry division doesn't have any money in their budget. The operations division doesn't have any money in their budget. And so we've been going around and around and around in circles. Um, in the meantime, what we've done is we have a, the spoil site that's there by the helipad, if you've seen that down by the recycle center on that same property. Uh, today, we push forward with a local contractor to go in and get that thing up to speed so it'll take the spoil. And in the meantime, the core believes it can get a dredge that it can borrow from uh, Norfolk to come down in the first part of August to do that dredge work. So we'll get the spoil site ready. The, they'll have a dredge. And so now the real question becomes, how do we pay for it and who's going to pay for it? And we've been around and around with that. I've been up all the way up through Alan Moran at DOT trying to figure out how to pay for that. And nobody has come up with a plan um, yet to pay for that. Um, we have to let somebody know at the core, like 
today or tomorrow so they can get that dredge scheduled. If we don't, we'll miss our windows to get the work done. So what we're proposing is for you to give me the authority to move some money around um, in our Oregon Inlet dredging account. We have $1.9 million left over that we did not spend last year. About 600000 of that's our money, and the other balance of that is uh, the state MOA money. And so what we're proposing is to take the cost to do the dredging at Rodanthe's 324000 is to move 324000 of that money out of that dredge account into the Rodanthe account for the Corps to do that work. And that's just, the, court, the money has been moved out of the state. It's already in the Corps account. And they're just going to have to designate it to go to a different purpose. Because we authorized it <laughs> for Oregon Inlet, I needed your permission to allow us to authorize it to be used for um, Rodanthe Channel. Um, again, 600000 of our money, the, the spoil has to be disposed of uh, in a proper area, either on a beach or to protect Highway 12. And so they'll be using not our 600,000. They acknowledge that when they use at least 600,000 of that account, they got to put it in one of those designated places because that's what it requires. Um, but nonetheless, they'll take it out of that fund. And so again, with that said, uh, we need that. We're still working to try to get the state to do something to, to pay for that. I think uh, Commissioner House has had some contact with some contacts in the Senate to, on the Transportation Committee that he knows, and I don't know what will come of it, but we can't wait for them to act. So if he gets it, then fine, we can reimburse our account. If he doesn't get it, then we're not slowed down by not having the money available. Any questions of the county manager? I don't have a question or a comment. Um, this is, and, and the same thing that I've been approaching uh, our representatives with, this is a, it's, it's an emergency f uh, ferry channel. It's something we're trying to be proactive about. If a hurricane were to come, we can't wait two or three weeks to leave Hatters Island wide open. So, uh, or, or even longer than that. Um, I think this is something that we definitely need to do to be proactive in a hurricane season and uh, to protect our citizens on Hatters Island. I move to approve it. I second. Okay, there's a motion on the floor by Commissioner House to approve the uh, move, appropriations of moving the money. And it's been seconded by Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to say something to you, just make a comment. I think it's a, appalling, quite frankly, that nobody has taken ownership of this problem. This is an emergency ferry channel for the transportation of our people to safety off an island. And NCDOT should step up. They should fund it. They should always have that channel open and ready to go. Uh, you know, they, it, th there's really no excuse, in my opinion. But that's just my two cents. Well said. Totally agree. Yep. Totally agree with that. Any, anyone else? <clears throat> with that being said, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <clears throat> motion carries unanimous. <clears throat> that brings us to the consent agenda. <clears throat> On the consent agenda, you have the approval of the minutes from June 17th. You have the annual CRS reports. You have a reimbursement resolution for fiscal year 2019-20 vehicle and equipment financing. You have the tax collector's report. You have Health and Human Services Public Health Division Agreement with AmeriHealth Curitas, North Carolina, a similar agreement with United Health, a similar agreement with Blue Cross Blue Shield, a similar agreement with WellCare, uh, and, a, and those three are the same. And then you have a division with a breakthrough grant, task force grant. Uh, you have a human health and human services increase in fees for a grant position, and you have a health and human services division diabetes provision, prevention program grant. <coughs> Move to approve. Motion, motion by uh, Vice Chairman Overman to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner House. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <coughs> Motion carries unanimous. Next are your board appointments. You have the airport authority. The terms expire this month for George Henderson, uh, Joseph Placatis, George Wood, and David Twitty V. George Henderson and Joseph Placatis would like to be reappointed. 
resignations were received from George Wood and David Twitty V. Uh, George Wood does not wish to be reappointed. The airport authority recommends that George Henderson and Joseph Lacayas be reappointed and that Walton Pete Berkheimer Jr. and Jonathan Chad Jones be appointed. Uh, you also have applications again from Pete Berkheimer, David Crownover, Terrence McGinnis, Gordon Milbreath, William Overman, and Chad Jones. Move to reappoint George Henderson and Joe Blakaitis and to appoint uh, Pete Berkheimer and Chad Jones. It's a motion on the floor by the vice chairman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner House. Any further discussion? I got one question. Yes, sir. Did I not read here that it says that George Henderson does not wish to be reappointed? Uh, that's a typo. That's, that's a typo. That's okay. George Wood. Should have been George Wood. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Good eye, Irvin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <coughs> Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next is the Dare County Waterways Commission. Fletcher Willie has resigned. The commission recommends that Kermit Skinner be appointed to replace Fletcher Willie. You have applications from Kermit Skinner, uh, Reed Corbett, Gordon Milbrath, Alan Moran, William Simmons, and Ron Whitaker. Move to appoint Mr. Skinner. There's a motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner Hall, uh, Couch to uh, present, uh, uh, to approve Kermit Skinner, Jr. Second. It's been seconded by Commissioner House. Further discussion? I, I would just like to say one thing. I think Rom Whitaker is a very strong candidate here, too. Rom is a waterman that's been on and in uh, virtually all of the waterways in Dare County. I'm, I'm a little <coughs> confused. There's a motion on the floor to approve and second it, Kermit Skinner. So, um, with that being said, any further discussion? So, we had some discussion in the waterways uh, with all due respect to Rom's capabilities uh, because of a number of people on that board that are in Hatteras and uh, again acknowledging Rom's countywide contacts, but the fact that Manio needs uh, some, some represent representation in that. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <laughs> motion carries unanimous. Next is the East Lake Community Center. The terms expire this month for Crystal Bass Knight, Joseph Sexton, and Shelly Parrott. Uh, the community center advises that Crystal Bass Knight and Shelly Parrott would like to be reappointed, and you have no applications. Move to reappoint Crystal Bass Knight and Shelly Parrott. Parent. Um, I don't know about Joseph Sexton. If I guess we could. You have an open. Position. You have an open. Have an open position. Yeah. Okay. Motion on the floor by the vice chair. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next is the Game and Wildlife Commissions. The term expires this month for Timmy Midget, Mike Johnson, and Edward Bo Meekins. All would like to be reappointed, and the commission recommends the same. You have applications from John Cook, David Hines, Ralph Shaler Meekins, Kenneth Peckerin, and Cam Cameron Whitaker. Motion to um, nominate Timmy Meekins, Mike Johnson, and Edward Bow Meekins. Motion on the floor by Commissioner Bateman. Is there a second? Second. Second by the vice chair. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next is the Park and Recreation Advisory Council. The term for uh, Dion Simmons expires and he would like to be reappointed. The council recommends that he be reappointed. You also have applications from Justin Bateman, John Cook, Lynette Ford, and Van Zola. <coughs> Move to reappoint Dion Simmons. Motion on the floor by the vice chair to reappoint Dion Simmons. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner House. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <laughs> Motion carries unanimous. Next is the Juan Cheese Community Center Board. The terms expire this month for Tina Sherrod, Bill Wilson, Sally DeFosse, Becky Beecham, and Joseph Lee Willis, all who would like to be reappointed, and the center recommends their reappointment, and you have an application from Justin Bateman. Move to reappoint all. Pleasure, uh, motion on the floor by the vice chair to reappoint all. Second. Seconded by Commissioner House. Further discussion? 
<clears throat> Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And next are your upcoming board appointments. In August, you have the ABC board, the Dare County Center Advisory Board, the Jury Commission, the Stumpy Point Community Center Board, and the Veterans Advisory Council. In September, you have the Health and Human Services Board and the Nursing Home Community Advisory Board, and you do not have any appointments in the month of October. Mr. Chairman, that would be your agenda. Thank you, County Manager. That brings <coughs> us to um, item 12, and that's commissioner's business. Um, before we get into that, I, I know um, uh, Mrs. Schreiber has been sitting here patiently uh, this evening. Um, I would like to ask the county manager to ask our planning department director to look into Ms. Shriver's request and maybe bring something to the board as, for a recommendation or look into that for us. Yes, sir. Um, one thing that she asked was about getting their subdivision on the county roads. And if you all will vote yay, I can have uh, the clerk get with her, fill out the proper paperwork you will have approved, and we can get that resolution into DOT before the next meeting and get that process moving for them um, right away. Great. Um, mm -hmm. And then we will have done our part, and it will be up to DOT then right. to put it on the system. I, I can talk to Don. I'm not sure what the answers are, but we'll sit down and talk with them. There's, there's some legal things with subdivisions that you right. can't, if it meets the conditions of coordinates, you can't say yeah. no, even if it creates the problems that they talk about because you're stuck with with that and when they're private roads, then we don't have the ability to control those. And so, I don't know, we'll, we can talk and, and look at those issues and, and I'll, if you will get with me tomorrow, I'll set something up and we'll take it from there. If it's a pleasure of the board, though, I would like to move forward. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the real important things that you stated also, which really raised my eyebrows, was drainage. Mm -hmm. Because right. we have had an issue with drainage on the North End recently. Right. Yeah. So we really need to look in whether you can just put a culvert in and say, yeah, it's good. Right. It needs to be able to handle the volume of water that you can see. So you need a motion from us on the road uh, issue? To uh, authorize the author resolution of the yeah. appropriate uh, paperwork from the county to move them towards the right. state road system. Yes. yes. So yeah, as a motion, uh, would, were you trying to make that motion, Commissioner Ross? Uh, yes, okay. I was. Uh, Commissioner Ross and Vice Chair and, and House, is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Bateman. Those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 As opposed, like sign. Motion carried is unanimous. Uh, Ms. Shriver, I'm sorry you had to sit through, but this is when... <laughs> it is a sensitive this, environment. This is when we like to respond to public comment. So I um, appreciate your patience. Thank you. Um, that brings us to, um, um, like I said, item uh, 12, and that's commissioner's business. Uh, Commissioner House, would you kick it off this evening? Sure, I'll start off on it. Mine's pretty brief because um, I've been pretty much tied up on one particular issue, and that was House Bill 483. Uh, at our last commissioner's meeting, uh, they were having a uh, committee meeting in Raleigh that following day. Uh, for uh, House Bill 483, which is the uh, Level Spawn Bill, I went and spoke at that committee meeting. Uh, that committee meeting actually passed the uh, the bill and was heard the very next day on the House floor. The day after that, it was voted on by the House and was passed by the House and has now gone to the Senate. So the past few weeks, I've been heavily on the phone and talking with several of our uh, senators in Raleigh uh, about the about the bill and uh, what the re repercussions of it could be, and uh, hopefully I'll make some headway with that as well. Um, it's been very trying, um, to say the least. Um, it's been very frustrating, to say the least, but we're making headway, I think. Um, with that, like I said, it, it, I've been tied up with that and also with you know, my business, because this, this is the busiest time of the year for me. Um, our uh, <clears throat> week in history, on the 20th, 
of this month, 1969, Apollo 11 made its first moon landing. Neil Armstrong jumped off of the lander onto the moon surface, and what significant items did he have in his pocket? I don't know, Hershey ball, I don't know, who knows? <laughs> uh, he had a one inch <laughs> piece of sateen cloth from the Wright Flyer 1901 Flyer, and also a piece of uh, wood, <coughs> wooden piece of the spur, which is now honorably displayed in the, in the newly uh, reconditioned uh, visitor center at the Wright Brothers Memorial. Um, on a lighter note, even than that, we have a pet of the week, which is Sasha. She's a mixed breed, 10 years old, and ready to go home and ready to play. Our pet of the week for this week is Sasha. Sasha is a beautiful mixed breed lady who is 10 years old. She lived with one family for her whole life, so you can imagine how shocked she was to end up here in the shelter. Sasha prefers to be the only fur baby in the home with older children who know how to respect the space she loves. Come and visit her, she's super sweet. To adopt Sasha or foster one of our other animals, you can come and visit us Monday through Saturday at our shelter located in Manio. Join us this week on Saturday from 8 to noon at the Manio Farmer's Market for dog baths for donations. And don't forget about our Paw Draw 50-50 raffle. You could win half the cash raised while supporting your OBX SPCA shelter pets. For more information, visit our website at www.obxspca.org or visit our OBX SPCA Facebook page. So Sasha's ready, ready to go home and ready to play, so definitely consider uh, Sasha to bring her new uh, fur baby to your house. Uh, if not, definitely go to SPCA if you are considering a fur baby and see what they have available. The best dog you can get is a dog that you can rescue from, from, a, uh, from, the, uh, from the pound. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the floor. Thank you, uh, Commissioner House. I, you know, good morning, America had something on the moon landing and they showed some so the facility where they were housing some of the rocks and stuff that moon rocks that they had brought back but there was some stainless steel containers that they had there that have never been opened mm. i'm curious as to, and they never said why have they waited all these years not to open those containers? Maybe they're waiting for Geraldo Rivera to open them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. And they'll be empty. That 50 was, years. They've, 50, not, opened they've yeah, not, opened not opened 50 it. years. <laughs> yeah. And I was just curious that if anybody knew. Because it was on Good Morning yeah. America the other morning. Yeah. And uh, I was just, I was thinking, why have they waited so long not to, <laughs> I don't know. It's going to be interesting now. Um, but thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to say congratulations to uh, all the Dare County athletes that were mentioned earlier and all others who received awards uh, this school year. Uh, Dare County tends to uh, turn out some awfully outstanding students, and uh, our congratulations certainly go out to all of them. Thanks to the Community Foundation uh, for their scholarships to Dare County students. Uh, it's astounding how much money they raise and how much they invest back Absolutely. into our students, and good on them for that. Uh, congratulations to our service pin recipient, Sarah Bradshaw, and to our Employee of the Month, Randy Grantham. And I uh, mentioned to, to uh, Commissioner House, I read, I read today, I th think mm -hmm. I read it today, that HB 483 is stuck in the Senate Rules Committee now and will not come up until a short session in 2020. Right. So oh, well, that was, if then. Uh, that's a good little piece of information to have right there. Well, thank you. It's all I have. Well, thank you, Vice Chairman. Commissioner Bay? Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to get down to um, Ocracoke, and when I was down there, I saw the ferry, the passenger ferry in action. Guys, it's really working. And what I was really impressed with, we went down to the docks in the afternoon and um, took my dogs and my golf cart down there, and people were getting on that ferry. They had bags. They were spending money. They were spending money. They were using the tram. I mean, it's, 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 I'm, I'm happy the way that's going down there, and it was full. What do we hear from Hyde County? I'm sorry? Have we heard from Hyde County a similar response? I, I don't know. I, don't know. I haven't heard either. I'm, I'm just, just curious. I just sir. spend a couple of days cleaning the house. So how, how often are they running, Urban? You know, I'm you not know. sure about that either. I think it starts, three or, at nine, three or starts four round trips a day. 
How many? Three or four. I think Three or four. Yeah. Maybe four. Uh, first, first boat over at 9.30 in the morning, which is good. I get your morning crew over there. And then for those that want to eat, uh, there's pretty much a sunset ride back. Right, and that thing will fly. So, and I think it's running one hundred percent occupancy, isn't it? It's packed. I mean, and, and the lines are, and the trams go all through the town. They drop you off at over there on um, by the Jolly Roger, and they'll take mm -hmm. you down to the ferry docks, drop you off, pick you up. So and it's just all that money down there to the five camp. Listen, we're just good. I'm just it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> well, we've got we've got that they build. boogie boards and all kinds of stuff they were bringing back with them, so they're spending money. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. We're trying yeah. to get that build grant in Hatters Village so we can have the same thing. So yeah, yeah, keep your eye on it. It, it'll be continued success story. Good. That's so perfect. so does it? Where does it leave out of? Right there at the, um, right, the dock. At direct at direct dock. Right. Yeah. Cool. Nice looking, great looking um, ferry, and um, I was just, I was really happy to see that down there. Right. The other, we've met, um, we've had one, two, three recovery court meetings. Um, that is really working. I was wow. uh, very um, energized and enthusiastic, um, and I appreciate you guys appropriating that money before I got on the board for that system there for $125,000. We have 10 um, applicants that are within the system now. Uh, this week we replaced a couple of them in recovery centers, uh, one for nine months, uh, another one for eight months. We have um, three or four that already have um, gone from the incarceration part to recovery um, uh, treatment centers. So the system's working, and it's a, um, it was a methodical decision-making process from, from individuals that just sat there and care about people and want to make a difference in their lives. So I was really enthusiastic about this thing it's going to work so, so instead of just carte blanche sending them to prison they're working with them trying to get them support and in recovery yeah and, and working that way that's good news and they and, and they interact with them one um had some time um clean and they give them a gift certificate to la Fagadas, and the judge thanks them and, and uh, gives them praise and that's what it's about super that's they, can, good. they can start going back to school. They are, they're checking in with their probation officers. They're checking in with their social workers. Uh, it's a, a um, tailored program per individual. Now, will, will we attempt to try to uh, follow their progress? Or the, the system does. The system yep. does. Okay. Great. Emily Ertz is the um, coordinator, and she's doing an outstanding job. Yep. Outstanding job. Good girl. Super. That's good stuff to hear. The other thing, just throwing this out there, I don't know if this is an issue that we need to be looking at, but I think it's a problem that we as a county need to address in somewhere. The new bridge we have, Hatteras um, Organ Link Bridge, we have two beautiful bike lanes on both sides. There's no um, rumble strips. There's only a white line that goes down the side on both sides when you're crossing over there on a bicycle. A driver driving is driving down the road and he looks over to the ship coming through there. There's nothing to keep him or alert him to the fact that there's a cyclist over there. I would like to see some kind of rumble strips, some kind of uh, awareness that he hits it, vibrates. The um, We're going to have an accident that's going to happen on that bridge, and I'm, I'm afraid it's going to happen. So I'd like to, if y'all think it's something we need to look into, have DOT check it out and see what the feasibility of uh, putting rumble strips or at least um, those white uh, the knockers. Paint, right. The painted white or yeah, yeah, on the road. Bots, yeah, we, we can certainly ask the county manager to uh, contact, right, right, right. Jennings, uh, contact Jerry okay. uh, and, or Alan and, and see if that can't be done. Good. That's all I got. Good, Good deal. deal. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Couch. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing up uh, Captain Momi. Uh, you know, aside from his sport fishing legacy, he did belong to all of us. You know, uh, he would talk to you about anything Outer Banks, and uh, some people might not have known his background here with uh, putting sport fishing on the map here. Uh, he's just a good guy. He's just a really good guy. Uh, we uh, lost uh, one of the early... Uh, uh, people who helped uh, Dare County uh, law enforcement move forward. Uh, she was a longtime dispatcher down there, Bertha K. O'Neill, and uh, I went to her service uh, 
Jack Scarborough, uh, our uh, longtime deputy here, I believe. Isn't he the captain down there? He's he's got a title. Uh, he, the way he figured it, she was probably involved in her career in saving uh, around 200 lives by expediting uh, her knowledge. She knew everybody. People would ask the EMS or EMTs would ask, uh, you know, we're having trouble finding this, and she would know where to send them every time. She monitored all those communications. Fantastic person. Uh, she, uh, just a beautiful service uh, there altogether. A lot of, just a down-home hatter service. I thoroughly enjoyed being there. Had an opportunity to go to the christening of the Cutter Midget there in Norfolk. What a blast that was. There was over 200 midgets there. As, <laughs> as we know, the midgets are big around here. Uh, uh, it was really cool. Uh, this had a nice sunset there. Uh, told some really funny stories. Very, very loving uh uh, the crew was, uh, she's going to be based on the West Coast, uh, but there were a lot of good stories going around. The captain, of the, uh, Captain McCabe, uh, told a funny story about uh, how the uh, Pacific Fleet Commander for the United States Coast Guard came over. Uh, he's an E-6, and uh, a, a, a destroyer came by. So one of your maritime traditions is military ships, they render honors. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually the ship who has the... Uh, uh, the one with the highest ranking member, uh, uh, the other ship has to initiate uh, uh, the render of honors. Well, the, this destroyer just automatically <laughs> assumed that, uh, you know, with two E-5s on there that the Coast Guard was going to initiate the rendering, but uh, uh, Commodore Hahn there was an E-6. <laughs> so these boats are passing and they're all watching it, and the two guys on the bridge are talking. You know, the Navy was like, we're waiting on you. And the Coast Guard guy was, we're waiting on you. We have an E-6. So the scramble there, <laughs> these two ships uh, were going uh, by. It was just really, military. really cool. Uh, I wanted to go represent the board, and I did get a chance to represent the board there. But just a fantastic. Uh, and she's already been in two. Uh, uh, it's very fitting that the uh, uh, Cutter Midget right off of Rodanthe, uh, she was on her way uh, to uh, Hampton Roads and uh, stood by for four hours uh, for a mariner in distress. She wasn't even outfitted for uh, SAR yet, uh, uh, search and rescue, but she stood by for four hours until somebody came by and uh, right, literally, almost right off of Chickamacomico. Well fitting with honors. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's a beautiful vessel, too. Uh, wanted to thank, uh, on behalf of the Waterways Commission, uh, Fletcher Willie for his uh, service. He, uh, he was appointed by uh, the chairman of uh, the board in the 80s there, uh, Mikey Daniels. That's a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, 87, know, 88. Yeah, he was our guru. Uh, Fletcher could always uh, just kind of pick out a fact that happened. He had a thick book, so we've got tons of policies and procedures and the benefit of his experience. I'm excited, though, for Kermit coming on board for the future of Manio. Uh, wanted to give a shout out to uh, our environmental health specialists down there on the island. I try and stay involved with the food trucks and the food establishments and uh, our environmental health specialists. And uh, they're firm, but they're fair. They, these are enforcement people. And uh, they're making two to three visits to whip uh, the people into shape. And uh, they're getting it done down there. And we're extremely busy down there. A lot of traffic, a lot going on, and all over the Outer Banks. That, that to me, that's very exciting. Uh, you know, when people are busy, there's less time to complain. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, they're just doing a great job. Also, the planning, uh, our planning staff, uh, they too, uh, we've been dealing with some uh, assorted issues as the Airbnb market expands. Uh, they've been on top of it, and they're enforcing the rules. Uh, I attended the community rating system meeting here uh, Thursday morning and uh, was quite surprised at the turnout. I am uh, I should have been, been, but uh, the uh, entire board of the Outer Banks Association of Realtors was here. Uh, you had insurance people, you had uh, uh, mortgage people, and uh, they're taking this seriously. And the overriding message that came out of there is, uh, as this board knows, because uh, uh, Donna has spoken to us a couple of times at least uh, when these flood maps uh, finally come into are enacted. 
uh, hopefully in the spring. We'll see if the moon and the stars lines up for that. But the overwhelming message is not to get, don't be lulled into a false insecurity just because you've been moved up into a more favorable zone <laughs> to get rid, uh, to forego your flood insurance because uh, these maps will change again in a couple of years. And if you want to try and save a little bit of money uh, by letting your flood insurance go, it's going to cost you. So hang in there. It's an investment. Yeah. Don't, don't let your flood insurance, uh, it's like our uh, brochure says, uh, low risk does not mean no, no risk. risk. Yep. 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 <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, that's a lot. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Commissioner <laughs> Tove. Okay, um, I've done quite a bit, actually, since I got back from vacation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, the first thing I did was uh, we had, which is one of my favorite things I do, is we had the Friends of Youth uh, Crystal Dawn fishing trip. Right. And it's Bonnie Bennett's last trip. Oh, so that, it was kind of sad, but on the, the she's the heartbeat she of it. She truly is. And the kids are just fantastic, and the fishing was good. I think everybody on the boat caught fish, so that, that was really a fun day. But we're going to miss Bonnie big time. Mm -hmm. um, next, I had a community advisory council for Peak Resources in Spring Arbor. Um, there's good and bad at both places, uh, mostly good, which I'm happy to say. Um, it's one of the challenges down here as everybody knows who has a business is getting people to work and that's that's one of the things that they're both facing is staffing issues uh, and also with that said the council the advisory councils uh, had a resignation because of uh, one of our members uh, has a health issue so she stepped down so uh, we're currently looking for a person to uh, Take that position it's 16 hours of training that you have to go through but it's a very rewarding uh thing that you get to do you get to meet people like bob's mom <laughs> and and have friends <laughs> down there there's a lot of them um next uh last week we had the oregon inlet task force meeting and i'm very excited to announce that all of our contracts are signed mm -hmm. um and, and completed, they're signed, completed with the state. The money's been dispersed. The first payment of $5 million is in our bank account. Um, they've signed, we've signed the contract with the private partner, and the state's okayed all of that. And the private partner has signed the contract with the marine architect. And as we speak, they are working on the design of the boat. They should have the preliminary design on the dredge done in three weeks. After that, we'll get to review it and then give them the go-ahead. And within uh, approximately four and a half months after that, we should have the final design and have it going into the RFP project or our, the request for proposals and, uh, and then the issuance of a contract with one of the shipyards to build. Now, back to sports. I know it's all Dare County kids that we talked about. Well, these are Dare County summer kids that have been coming to Pirates Cove for three months every summer. It's three boys. The youngest one who, you know how young boys take the grunt of their two older brothers. Well, he's been the punching bag the whole time, but that's made him tough. He's from New Jersey. He holds, this was his senior year in high school, he broke the all-time scoring record for the state in lacrosse. And he was, his name's Canyon Birch, great, great kid. Not only that, he was selected to the All-American Lacrosse High School team where they played, and he scored four goals wow. in that game. Wow. He, he's really a super kid. He's got scholarships coming from everywhere. <laughs> and... Uh, Speaking of Omi, I think that my anybody who knows Omi would appreciate this. My last word of the night is going to be, "Woo!" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stay top <laughs> off. Yep. Well, that's good pass. news. Good news on the uh, dredge, and yeah. Larry, the cable guy, would say, "Get her done." Get her done. <laughs> Get her done. Good news. Thank you, Jim.
Commissioner Ross. Sounds like that dredge is still a little bit off before we see it moving sand. Probably 18 months to two years. Mm -hmm. okay. You know how old I'll be by the time that happens? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. First off, I just want to say August the 8th, Vice Chairman uh, Overman, Commissioner Couch and I, and County Manager uh, Bobby Outen will be going to D.C. for the White House Intergovernment Affairs Conference, along with representatives from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee, something that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you and the Vice Chair went last year. We did. And it will be a, kind of a panel discussion with some senior administration aides regarding infrastructure, bridges, uh, inlets, Wi-Fi access, all those things related to our section of the country that we need attention on and help from federal government. On July the 18th this week, we have another Albemarle Commission meeting, and our representative uh, Bobby Hannig will be there. So I'll get a chance to ask him some questions about local legislation, especially let him spawn. And I would just comment that uh, a certain senator informed me last month that he assured me it would not go out for a vote, and it sounds like, indeed, it will not. Well, like I said, that was also told to us from the House member, too, and it went for a vote in the House, so I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> okay, then. Secondly, I wanted to point out we are involved in the Albemarle Commission with something called a revolving loan program. It has pr proven quite problematic for us. It's kind of like we're not in the loaning banking business, and... Uh, the commission is, as a group, looking to exit that plan. Yeah. And lastly, there is also, and this is something I'll look into more because I'm not familiar with the particulars, a sort of inland ferry proposal called the Harbor Town Project where ferries would run from Columbia in and around the Sound to various towns. Initially, the uh, regional planning organization, the RPO, which is part of Albemarle Commission, has not come out in favor of such a plan. And uh, I'm, I'm just curious about understanding more before I try to persuade you to a position as a member of the Albemarle Commission. But uh, I don't know, it sounds like it might be a bit of a flyer with regard to how it might drive tourism and traffic and travel inland. The Audit Committee met earlier today with Dave, Sally, uh, and the rest of the Audit Committee, Commissioner Bateman, and uh, I was quite satisfied. I think we are really moving ahead with internal auditor uh, Ernie, and he has got a work plan laid out and auditing various aspects of our operations, and I really applaud you guys on the work you're doing there and uh, Ernie's progress in such short time. And finally, I've reached out to Saga Construction after the planning meeting when their hotel proposal was not moved forward and they re re withdrew it. I'm uh, going to try to reach out to Sumit Gupta, the fellow that was the gentleman here that night, and ask him a little bit more about housing. I've talked to County Manager Outen about it. And there's some land that we have here on Roanoke Island, and I just try to, I'm going to try to learn some more about what exactly goes into their planning and how they make decisions. Not asking them to do anything, but seeing if I can get an hour of his time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Ross. <clears throat> um, County manager. Yes, sir. Uh, several things. One is on the inner ferry that you just broached. I have received several phone calls from various officials in the region about what our position was on that. And I told him we didn't have a position, that we didn't, no one's been up here and presented anything to us, and that our board really hasn't discussed it or taken a position. And if someone's looking for us to provide an opinion or take a position, they need to come give us some information so that y'all can make informed choices. And so I don't know if anybody's coming, they might call back to set an appointment or do anything, but it is floating around out there. Beyond. I will learn a lot more on yeah. Thursday. Yeah, okay. Um, we have all, we, we talk a lot about doing our inlets and we put some money in doing the inlets and uh, we, we sort of have the inlet process down now. Uh, but we have other channels that are federal channels that are out there that from time to time need dredging. They're not in the category of the inlet where they need full-time dredging. It might be every three years or five years or six years, but from time to time they need uh, dredging. And the issue has arisen that there 
the spoil sites, the traditional spoil sites that they use for those dredging projects have, are either full or about to be full and that some planning needs to be done for future spoil sites to keep those, what I'm going to call internal inlet or internal channels, if you will, um, open. Um, the Corps has been to us and talked to us about it, talked to us about their concerns. I tried to put it back on them and say, they're your channels and they're federal projects. You find the spoil sites and they produced some 1957 agreement that when they designated those channels as federal channels, the county agreed to provide spoil sites. So we're kind of on the hook to deal with spoil sites going forward if we want them to keep doing our channels. Um, I talked to Ken Wilson, who's our consultant on all those kinds of things about that. Um, he's, he and his firm are prepared to go out and do some work to try to look and see where we could put spoil sites, look at what the volumes we need, the area we need, kind of give some thought and some planning to that so that we don't wind up five years from now ready to do a channel and we end up like we are over here in Manio with Shallow Back Bay trying to scramble around to figure out what we're going to do with the spoil, we do some planning up front. Um, the issue is that that process costs somewhere between uh, $75,000, $80,000 to get them to do that planning, to do all that work, that engineering work for us. Uh, we haven't budgeted that anywhere. Um, I haven't even talked to Dave about where we might do it other than the contingency, contingency. Uh, to go forward. Uh, but it's something that we need to go forward with, whether we make a decision tonight, whether you want us to look at it a little bit deeper and get Ken to really hone in on what ex exactly it's going to be and maybe Dave and I talk about how to fund it and we'll bring it back. It's not critical that we decide right this second, but we do need to do something one way or another uh, in the upcoming meetings to, to figure out what direction we're going to go in with that. And so unless you all tell me, forget it, we don't want any part of it, I'm going to ask Ken to hone down, do something specific as to what he's got give us some exact numbers. I'll talk with Dave about how to fund it. We'll come yeah, back yeah, to you. I, I agree. That's critical. That's critical. And here's how big a problem it is. We've, we've got a relatively small project here in Manio, 65,000 cubic yards, somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. Yeah. We can't figure out where to put it. That's right. Well, we've, and we've, I got, mean, that's some, a small we've got some alternatives, but they're nowhere. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they can't handle the, the amount. They're not out And there's, yeah. there, there's some exciting things happening in the industry that are out there on the horizon. They've done in some places. They're, they're doing a thing now where they're top dressing uh, marshes. Right. And, and because of sea level rise. Yeah. <laughs> it's one time you can use sea level rise as a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of marsh. So, you know, I don't know if that's something CAMA would ever allow or whatever. But I, I think Bobby and I had a conversation about this. I personally think it's... T time to act on I it. I do too. Because we're going to get too. behind the eight ball. Then we'll, we'll get something going and get back to you on that. You need a motion? I don't. I, I'll need that when I get enough for you to vote on. Okay. So. All right. Um, in the consent agenda, you all approved a bunch of Medicaid contracts that are non negotiable with the state to various <laughs> providers. Um, we're going to get some more contracts like that, I believe, for our EMS services as well. And if you all would like, you can give me the authority to go ahead and approve those. They'll be the same. They're, they're state negotiated. We can't change them contracts. And so rather than burden your inbox with 400 pages of contracts, you can authorize me to I read every one those. of them. <laughs> yes. I believe I did. Oh. Are you reading all of them? I, I have, well, I've read the first one, but they're all the same. <laughs> they're all the same. They're all the same. Um, so if you give me that permission, I won't burden you with those again. So moved. Yeah, yes. second. Yeah. Motion on the floor by the Commissioner Ross, seconded by Commissioner Couch. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign? Motion carries unanimous. Um, I got an email during the board meeting from Drew over uh, at our EOC, and our reentry passes are now available. We're, we're doing them a little different. Uh, in the past, you had to call over there, fill out some forms, do all this stuff, and we would mail you these <coughs> passes. Uh, he's created an, an online system that we're going to try for the first time this year. So if you're the priority one or priority two, or priority three, the people that come in in the various stages, you can now go online, get those reentry passes by filling out uh, 
the form that's appropriate to which level you're in uh, for your reentry. And so I say that for the public to go online and check those out. I've had some calls, when are we getting our reentry passes? When are we getting our reentry passes? Well, now you can go online and get them now. Um, I would suggest that you do it now. Don't wait till the hurricane's floating around <laughs> off Hatteras to get your uh, reentry passes because it'll be a nightmare if we have a glitch because we've got so many other things going on. So uh, go online, check it out. There's phone numbers in there. If you have problems, you can't figure out what to do. If you call over there, they'll take you through that process. Maybe Dorothy, in her remarks, probably knows more than me. and She can add to what I just said. Um, Got it. But, uh, again, I wanted to get that out there so the public would know. Um, and then the last thing, um, whether we do it now, Mr. Chairman, or after. Uh, we'll do it after. Okay, uh, I need a closed session for yeah. just a minute. Okay, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, on the same note as uh, uh, EOC, um, I've talked to Drew today, and um, as as you very well know, we've already had two storms out there. Uh, just to be on proactive, uh, we're going to have a control group meeting uh, on uh, July the 29th, just to bring the mayors in, and uh, just so we got got our thoughts together and everything going. So I'll keep you all abreast of that. It'll be a brief meeting; but it'll be about an hour, but. We want to get everybody geared up just in case, to, you know. Good pre-plan measure. Yeah, yeah, so just to let you all know that, um, that that'll take place. Dorothy, our public information officer, do you have anything for us? I was going to speak about the, the online permitting system. They put a lot of work into it. I think, you know, it, I, I'm excited about it. I think once people get accustomed to it, they'll like it as well. They'll, they may have some questions at first, but. Um, I didn't mean to steal your thought. No, 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 no. <laughs> but one thing we, that, that we did was anyone who signed up for our emergency notifications received an, an alert this afternoon saying, hey, it's available now. So, and we have a large number of subscribers to that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We really do. In, People invaluable. really appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, I'm just, on a lighter note, I, I'm going to show you all a video, and I don't do this a lot, but I want to, we have a new, um, a new format. It's called On the Job with Rich Coleman. Rich is a local photographer who does some photography <coughs> for the county from time to time, and we were thinking about doing this segment, and we all thought, you know, he, he'd be really good with, with folks, so he gets in vehicles with employees and talks to them about their work. And so we're going to show you, hopefully, Matt has one queued with a trash truck driver. Um, do you have it, Matt? Yeah, here it comes. It's typical. He works very in dark hours. It was photographed. <laughs> yeah, it was photographed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, you sure you want to follow You see that black bear? Yeah. <laughs> it was staying late all the time. Headlights. Oh, that's just in, a in a minute, you'll see the headlights. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll I'll, I'll talk for another second. If it doesn't come up, we'll do it next time. But we've we've started with the trash truck driver. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Well, no. he he has he has. Riding around with Sasha. He has a pet riding around. <laughs> Actually, um, but we've done some some with EMS, with with med flight, and with an with an in an ambulance, and we'll continue the set, the feature. You know, we were thinking the social services, the aids, doing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Would be, that there's would just be, a lot of people that who use mm -hmm. vehicles to perform their services, and it's a kind of a neat way for people to learn about Absolutely. some of our services, but we'll do it next time. Okay. It's a precursor to the yeah. next meeting. Stay tuned, ladies and Thank gentlemen. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> Good deal. Teaser cool. <laughs> Finance Director Dave, you had three great items this evening for us. You have anything else for us to see? Uh, just to let you know, we had our kickoff meeting with the Architect on Health and Human Services last Friday. Oh, great. Good, Good deal. Good. Good deal. All right. County man. <laughs> yes, sir. Pursuant to the provisions of NCGS 143-318-11A5, 
I need a motion to go into closed session to instruct the county staff negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by on behalf of the county in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease in the matter of the property at 1042 Westcott Park Road and 1036 George Daniel Roads, each owned by the Drake heirs. So moved. Motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner House. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing those, those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> motion carries unanimous. Aye. I'll call the uh, Dare County Board of Commissioners meeting back to order. Turn it over to the county manager. In the closed session, the board approved the minutes of the last closed session and instructed the county staff on behalf of uh, the negotiating, act, uh, negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken on behalf of the price material terms of a contract for the acquisition of real property. Took no other action. Thank you. Thank you, county manager. That completes our meeting this evening. Is there a motion to adjourn until 9 a.m. on August the 5th, so 2019? Moved. Motion on the floor by Commissioner House. It's been seconded by... Nobody. <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Bateman. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. <laughs>